already gotten through um, a, a whole lot. Um, so before I get into uh, you know my part of this, can I just ask if Mia or uh, Witara has anything that they'd like to say uh, before we start off? Thanks, Ben. Uh, I just want to remind you, the participants, that uh, program of today is we will start with the discussions of the questions that Ben has laid out yesterday. Then uh, it will follow by the introduction to the online platform under this whole project of the like Asia Latin America blockchain integration. Uh, we run through the platform, which is still uh, in the beta versions, and we're happy to, to get their feedback. And then after that, I I would like to uh, invite Mia to, to say some things. So that, that is the half day program of today. In case that um, the discussion points that we, we are going to, to discuss today, uh, if you have if, if you would like to, to, to discuss, please raise your hand or um, type in the chat box and then we will we will make it alert to Ben that uh, you have the questions. Yes, so maybe maybe just to follow up on that. I mean, I, I think this session will go best if we all talk to each other. Um, so doing it in chat. Um, I, I understand that not everyone is is in a situation where they can easily talk. Uh, there may be background noise or all that sort of thing. So that that's fine. Uh, if that is your situation, please uh, type your your question or your comment uh, in chat. Um, but but otherwise, what I'd really like to do is ask you to use the hands up function. So if you look at the top of your screen, um, about two thirds of the way over. Uh, there's a little hand icon and if you press that, I can see that you've got your hand up and would like to say something and I can then uh, give you the floor. Um, so hopefully hopefully that will be clear for everyone. Um, as Witata said, I mean, what we'd like to do today, it, it is an interactive session. Um, so the discussion questions, um, you know, I, I'm hoping that it's not just going to be me uh, talking about what I think uh, the, the answers might be. Um, some of these questions don't have uh, just one answer. They, they have different points of view, and I'm hoping that uh, we can get some of that across. So I think we'll, uh, you know, having seen some of the responses uh, that, that you've sent in uh, overnight, and thank you very much for that, um, my feeling is that we'll probably spend a, a lot of time on the discussion questions and on your questions uh, from the lecture material. Um, and probably a bit less time on the empirical exercise. So I, I might sort of show you uh, a, a little bit more of, of, of what I thought a, a way would be of uh, attacking that. We, we can hear from you guys uh, as well, of course, um, but I think I will do uh, part of that as a, as a demonstration. So we've got about two and a half hours. We're gonna take a short break uh, in, in the middle. Um, and what I'd like to do first, um, you know, given that this is an online course, and uh, you know, you've been watching videos, doing readings, all that sort of thing. I really would like to get a sense of how people felt about the material. So I'm gonna ask you to use your raise hand button and specifically, can you please raise your hand if you felt that the material was at about the right level? That is to say, you could understand it, even if it was a bit challenging. Um, so if, if you could understand the material, but you found it perhaps a bit challenging from time to time, please just raise your hand. I saw many hands now. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing a good number of hands up, so that's that's very satisfying. Is it just a test or, or is there really something to discuss now? Uh, I just want to get a sense of where the discussion is going to be because if the answer to that question had been that uh, half the people in the room hadn't understood the, the material, then we'd do the discussion at a very basic level. If people have understood and absorbed the material, I think we can go a bit further uh, in, in it. So it's a, it's a diagnostic uh, tool for, for me. So look, that, that, that's great. That, that tells me that, uh, that it, it was at the right level. If you can please uh, now undo the, uh, the, the hands up uh, uh, notification. Um, so just uh, turn, that, uh, turn that blank if you simply click on it again. Um, so, so that's great. Look, uh, what I'd like to do first before we get into the discussion questions 
is to take some of your questions uh, from the lecture material. I've, I've got the lecture slides here so I can share my screen um, and, and we can all sort of look at the same material if need be. Um, but I see that there are a few that I think the Secretariat uh, put into chat. So let, let me maybe start. Oh, the, these are the discussion questions that have been recopied. OK, I, I see what that is. So then let, let me ask, does anyone have uh, a question that they'd like to ask based on the lecture material? Okay, I see uh, Samantha, your hand is up. Would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Samantha, the floor is yours. You'll just need to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. Yes, um, good morning. Um, my question is, um how does or how will the covid-19 pandemic affect the global value chains um and is the future of global value chains uncertain given that given the situation that's a great question hey there's there, there's no warm up uh, in 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 this setting we're straight into the hard ones um so let me try and give some thoughts on that. I'm, I'm not sure that I have a, a simple answer to it because I think it is simply too early to know at this stage. Um, let me talk about two dynamics that I observe. Now, I'm uh, from, from my accent, you can tell I grew up in Australia. Um, I actually live in the United States. Okay, I've been, been living in, in the United States for a long time. Um, so here in the United States, uh, we, we had uh, two kind of reactions about value chains. And the first one was to say, oh my God, uh, we're relying on other countries for uh, medical masks and hand sanitizer and all this kind of stuff that we desperately need during the, the COVID pandemic ventilators as, as well. And uh, so one reaction was to say that we need to bring that activity back into the United States. We need to reshore the activity, shorten the value chain and ensure that in an emergency, everything is is there within uh, the domestic economy to supply these needs. So that that's one reaction. And of course, in the early stages of the pandemic, I'm, I'm in New York City where, where we had a, a really uh, terrible time in, in sort of April, uh, March, April and, and into May. And, you know, we saw that some of the supply chains uh, had real difficulties in getting goods to consumers in sufficient quantity. So that was very true of uh, uh, things like uh, 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 disinfectant, household disinfectant and bleach. Um, it was also true of hand sanitizer uh, and masks, of course. Um, but then what was remarkable to me was that within the space of, of really no more than a month or six weeks, um, every store in Manhattan, every hardware store, every pharmacy you go into is as full as can be of hand sanitizer. Um, so the supply chains actually responded incredibly quickly. Um, same for masks. So all, all this stuff now, you know, you, you can buy these things for, for a dollar in, in any store that, that you go into. Um, the, the grocery stores all have these things you pump as you go in. I mean, it, it, it seems like an endless kind of supply of this stuff. So we've gone from thinking, uh, you know, everything's got to be supplied domestically to, oh, actually in an emergency supply chains even when they're global, can respond incredibly quickly. So uh, when we think of the post-COVID era, uh, I don't think that uh, 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 as things stand at the moment, we're going to see a wholesale unraveling of the global chain, uh, global value chain model that we've come to know and love uh, over the last sort of 20 or 25 years. Now, what we might see um, is on a commercial level, companies thinking about how to manage risk in the in the chain. Now, this was something we didn't talk about in, in the slide, but the complexity of the value chain, it's like a very complex network. And th there's a whole uh, area of applied mathematics coming now into economics where you model the impact of shocks that hit one bit of that network. How do they propagate through the rest of the network? And it may be that the way our networks are designed at the moment are not in fact optimal for, for dealing with the sorts of shocks uh, that we face. So, you know, my take on it is that from a business perspective, we may well see some changes in the ways 
that uh, businesses uh, effectively analyze and price risk within value chains. And, and of course, resilience being the flip side of risk. Um, the big unknown is what happens on a policy level. Um, so there's been all sorts of uh, difficult times for trade policy over the last few years. Um, this could be one more. If, if countries really decide that the appropriate way to respond to this or the way that they want to respond is through active trade policy deliberately designed uh, to shorten value chains. If that happens, then yes, we will see um, a, a major change in the business model. Um, but I tend to hope, um, and of course it's dependent on uh, political variables, but I tend to hope that uh, what we will see is something that takes place more in a business sense and less in a, in a kind of uh, intrusive policy sense. I think the pandemic has taught us a lot about policy, uh, social protection policies, health policies, uh, all these sorts of things. And I think it would be great uh, to work on those areas. Uh, I personally am not convinced um, that value chains is one where we really need policymakers uh, to sort of take a strong stand um, um, about uh, what a value chain should should look like. So I hope that that sort of answers your your question a bit. It's a, as I say, it's a very hard one. And I've really just given you my point of view. There are lots of people with uh, different points of view. Uh, maybe I can move on to Anjali now. You you have a question as well. So please just un unmute yourself and uh, feel free to ask. Sure. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so I have uh, so, uh, somewhere in in the lecture note two in the uh, there's a link that. There could be reasons for inconsistent inconsistency, and that's why the WWZ is a more uh, robust or a preferred kind of a decomposition. So, if 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 you could just illustrate uh, or state a bit more under what conditions this these kind of inconsistency, where for instance total exports turn out to be zero, and therefore we are not able to find out the proportions. One is, this is my first question, and the second one is, if you could elaborate on uh, the the PDC, the pure double counting term, what is that? When when products uh, change the domestic border more than once, they go out and then they come back and they go out. So is, is the value addition still happening in, at, in, 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 in this category also? There must be, but if you could please elaborate. And uh, if, if, if so, what is and and the third one is that what is this term uh, in the decomposition, which is DVA int rex, int rex. So, uh, if 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 you could elaborate on the third term, um, thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Great, great questions. Uh, again, let me go in reverse order. So, I, I think the easiest one to answer is DVA int rex. Um, so DBA Intrex is domestic value added that is shipped out of the origin country and is then used in some other country to produce that own country's exports. Okay, so if I'm South Korea and I export a, a, an LCD uh, screen to China for an iPhone and a factory in China takes that screen and combines it with a whole bunch of other stuff and makes an iPhone, which it then exports to the United States, that's DBA Intrex. So the, the, the screen is captured in DBA Intrex. That, that is an export from South Korea that goes to China, but then becomes part of China's exports to the United States. Okay, so essentially, so it's, essentially yeah. it's, it's the forward linkage of Korea's exports to China, is that? Correct, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, it, it's a close analogy to the to the concept of forward linkages. So the for, forward linkages was defined in a particular way uh, in the literature, and this actually leads to your first question. Um, and that exact definition is slightly different. And the reason why it's inconsistent, you you hit on one reason. You can have a sector where there are zero uh, gross exports, but there are still forward linkages. So then when you do the percentage, you 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 get a number that, that's infinite because you're dividing by zero. So that, that's not very helpful. Um, the other thing that can happen that's not very helpful, um, and indeed I've seen this happen in, in real uh, data, is that you calculate uh, uh, forward linkages at the sectoral level, um, and they're actually greater than uh, gross exports. Okay, so again, not particularly helpful. Um, so there's a couple of fixes for that. The, the WWZ decomposition takes a different approach to uh, uh, organizing all of this 
information. So it's really, I, I think of it as like an accounting decomposition. It's like they've come to gross exports and they've carved it up into each of the bits that possibly be consistent with the definition of, of what we're talking about and the definition of, of GBC, of, of value added trade that lies behind. So you get this perfectly consistent sort of carving up. Then the second thing that they do, and, and I haven't done it in the exercise because we had data that was generally pretty well behaved, um, but the other thing they do is, is to say, okay, we may think about expressing some of these ratios relative to value added rather than uh, relative to export. So that, that gets rid of the problem, uh, the, the sort of the, the, the scaling problem and the zero trade flow problem. Um, so those are the, the two uh, in, inconsistency issues. Then uh, PDC is exactly what the name suggests. It's pure double counting. So these are goods and services that are being counted in more than one country's trade statistics when in fact all you've got is backwards and forwards movements of intermediates that are ultimately put into something else and, and shipped off. So it's simply netting out all of that double counting. Um, if you think back to the example I gave, of, you remember the circle, country A, country B, country C, there was some obvious double counting there um, because we had a movement of uh, intermediates in, in the example. Um, so hopefully that clears up those questions. Um, I, I see that Risty has a hand up as well. Please, you, you have the floor if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thanks, Ben. And also thanks for the lecture materials. Uh, I find it uh, really useful and a, a bit of refresher. Um, and I took a couple of notes. So I, I put in the chat, so probably it's uh, a bit easier for you to also read. So a couple of things like, can we merge uh, uh, TIFA data from different sources. You know, um, I've used uh, WIRD before, but um, I'm not really familiar with ADB. Um, and I think I read the lecture, uh, I watched lecture two video when I was a bit sleepy last night. So could you please explain a bit more? <laughs> I mean, the AST uh, time zone. So uh, about step four, uh, you know, pick one number and then can you please explain how you get that from the previous um, matrix? matrices and lecture three uh there's a mention of startup file uh I, I think you refer to something that you that that is also put in the user guide just to note that and uh there are a couple of dot points that i hope you could explain a bit more slide six uh second third and fourth bullet points uh i i thought they were coming from the graph that is shown there but i, I um, it, it was not really clear for me how, how you drive this um, interpretation. And the slide number 10, um, we normally, I think, only look at the uh, foreign value added when we look at the backward linkages, but the, I think the graph says that there's also PDC there. Um, and you yeah, just with the empirical exercise, although I note that uh, you probably wouldn't focus that much, uh, because there's no header in the Excel file. So I was I was just assuming that the first column of the numerical values is term one, and and so I don't know how to read that term one, term two things, and just some possible applications if you still have time to respond to these. Um, uh, is it common to use uh, like the D, uh, DVA and FVA as uh, like de dependent variables, I say in the gravity model, to and 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 then we can look at the determinants of uh, the GVC participation. Um, and something that I'm uh, I've been quite interested in understanding is about the e-commerce. Uh, what's your take? How how does going to disrupt this trade in value added, if any? Yeah, thank you. Ben. Okay, great. So bear bear with me. So I, I I noted that, but there was a lot of questions. So I, I might have to come back to you and and, and get you to ask uh, some some of them again. But again, they, these are excellent questions. And by the way, I do see that there are some questions in chat. So I'll come to those next, and then I see uh, at, at least one more uh, hand hand up, uh, which which I will uh, come to. So. Um, you know, first, firstly, uh, just a, a short one, the empirical exercise. The, the first Excel file that was put up online was indeed missing uh, the header, which I apologise for. That's not very helpful. Um, we, we fixed that uh, sort of shortly after the call last night. Um, so the file that is up online now has all the header columns and you, you can go through and, and hopefully use it uh, with, without incident. 
Um, the application question, I, I think, is a is a really nice one. I mean, yeah, there there is a a small literature out there where people take variables. It, it tends not to be uh, just sort of DVA and FVA. It tends to be some proportion. So, you know, FBA as a proportion of gross exports, for example, or, you know, uh, so, so that, that's kind of backward linkages relative to gross exports, or it might be forward linkages, DBA interex uh, relative to uh, gross exports, and then try and explain those uh, with different variables. I, I will caution you, it's not always obvious that gravity is the right model to do that. Um, so one of the beauties of gravity is that it has a nice, strong theoretical basis now. Um, so if, if you want to look at value added gravity, there's a literature on that um, and, and anyone who's interested can email me. I, I can give you some references on that, um, but you, you have to be really careful um, because of the way the models are set up that that has real implications uh, for the way you estimate the model, for the type of data you use, uh, for the way you set up your fixed effects and then for the way you interpret results. Um, so you do need to be really careful uh, in, in doing that. Um, Okay, I think I got muted there. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, e-commerce e obviously uh, is is very hard to measure in in the data. Um, I don't think it undoes the business model at all. In, indeed, I think it makes it stronger. A lot of a lot of the business model that we're talking about actually runs on e-commerce, e so it, it strengthens uh, the, the whole idea of value chains. Um, as for tracking it in the data, that's really, really hard. Um, in fact, I was writing just today on, you know, how we talk all the time about the, 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 the data economy and all the technological change that's going on. We actually haven't got the first clue about how to value data. We, we've got these enormous flows of data going cross border, uh, cross borders. We, we know they're important, but we, we know very little about how to value them. And of course, everything in an input output table is something we can value through a market transaction. Um, so, so that is, you know, in, in input output tables are great. Um, but they're not infinitely wonderful. They, they don't tell us everything we could ever imagine knowing. And things like e-commerce, things like data, um, I think this is definitely part of the answer. It, it gives us a sense of how we can start to understand these sorts of things uh, a bit better. But my feeling is that we need to do uh, some more work on that. Now, uh, input output tables, that one of, one of your questions was on combining uh, data for input output tables. I, I wouldn't do that. Um, for the simple reason that all of these tables are trying to do much the same thing, but they do it in subtly different ways um, and sometimes less than subtle. Um, so in some cases, the sectoral disaggregation uh, can be quite different. So between OECD, uh, TIVA and uh, the ADB or WIOD, um, there, there's a, a, a significant difference in sectoral uh, coverage. Then again, with EORA, you lose uh, nine or 10 sectors uh, when you start using that. So putting these things together, uh, I, I think is, is a bit risky. The, the way that I do it in my own work is to look for the input output table that covers the countries and sectors that I'm interested in. Um, that, that's question number one. Then question number two, is to try and use a source that is reasonably up to date. And for that one, I think the work that ADB has been doing with its partners is really first rate. So a, a lot of these other products are uh, cut out in about 2015. Um, the ADB product for Asia and its partners uh, goes to 2019. And the joint product uh, that also covers Latin America goes to 2017. So it's very, very up to date uh, data. And, you know, just to, to be clear, it's an ADB product. Um, but there are also countries from uh, North America and from Europe um, that, that are in the, the database. So it's a, it, it covers uh, major uh, uh, major trading partners as well. Uh, Anjali, was there another question that I missed as I went through? Oh, the, the, the ones on the slides. Okay, so um, let's get to, uh, okay. 
So I think it was, uh, can you remind me which slide on lecture two it was? Oh, yes, just a second. I'll, I'll pull it up and I'll, I'll just let you know. Slide, um, 30, slide 43, 39, 43 first, the, the, the terms, slide 43, lecture two. Ah, yeah. OK, so I, I'm actually not going to walk you through that. So I deliberately presented that in a very uh, sort of schematic way. All that I want you to take away from it is actually the first line, OK, that we've got uh, bilateral exports in, in this case from country S to country R, and we break it down into three aggregates, domestic value added, foreign value added and pure double counting. All of the rest is a whole bunch of mathematical magic as to how we get those aggregates. So, uh, you know, I did define the, the main matrices that go in it. So, so V, the value added, V, the, the Leontief, uh, uh, the, the global Leontief, L, the local Leontief, all these sorts of things. Um, but I, I think if you're really interested in what each of those terms means, um, you, you're going to have to read the, the Wang Wei Zhu uh, paper from 2013 and they, they go through it in uh, infinite detail. Was there anything else, Anjali, or does, does that uh, cover your questions? That covers all my queries, uh, but I would just like to discuss on the assignment. If, if I could take up that point very briefly right away. Actually, maybe we can come to the assignment uh, later on when, when sure. we turn to the sure. exercise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for, for then. OK, uh, let me just scroll back up in the chat now because there were a couple of uh, questions um, in the chat. Let me just find it. OK, so can we? Oh, I think we've I've answered most of these. Um, OK, if we analyze foreign value added in gross exports, does it mean country A's exports has a content from country B or country A contributes to country B's exports? Uh, those two things are mirror images. So the first one is what we mean by foreign value added in gross exports. So if I export a uh, computer from the United States to Malaysia and inside that computer is a hard disk that I imported from uh, Singapore, then my foreign value added in, in my gross exports is the value of that hard drive in the computer. OK, so foreign value added, think backward linkages, think getting intermediate uh, goods and services from abroad. The flip side is the one we talked about before, DVA interex, commonly uh, called forward linkages. That's where I export something to another country, that country takes my stuff, mixes it with other stuff, adds their own value, and then exports that somewhere else. Um, so the two things are mirror images, um, but but we typically, depending on perspective, refer to it as, as uh, backward or forward linkages. Um, uh, Preeti, I believe your hand is up. Can I give you the floor and ask you to unmute your mic? Uh, hi, Ben. Uh, thank you for for the presentation slides and organize this. So I have uh, two questions. Um, one is related to the difference between DVA and DVA inter exports. So uh, and how do you figure these two terms while calculating the total value added? So do you include both of these along with the foreign value added term and the double counting term? in order to find out the total value added for a particular product. And uh, my second question is, um, how do we conclude whether a country is integrated strongly or weakly in the GVCs? Uh, because uh, for a country like India, I was getting some numbers like 0 0.45, 0 0.50 uh, for the DVA and foreign value added. So uh, on the basis of such like trivial numbers 0.45 how how do i make a conclusion whether india is integrated deeply or weakly in the global value chains yeah these are these are great questions so let me take those uh one one, one by one so first thing to note you know uh, dva is an aggregate and it's made up of a whole bunch of different stuff and one of the things that is included in dva is dva interex 
okay? And the, the, the reason it's included is that we're talking about my value added, you know, that, that originates here in the exporting country that I send abroad and some third country uses in order to make its exports. So when we calculate DVA, it includes uh, DVA index. FBA and PDC are different concepts, okay? So uh, we are looking there at either uh, statistically uh, double counting particular movements of goods and services, or uh, we're looking at the use of uh, intermediate goods and services that I, the exporting country, get from abroad and incorporate in my uh, exports. So uh, from an accounting perspective, DBA plus FBA plus PDC is always going to give you, by definition, the value of your gross exports. Okay, so you can add those three and you will always get uh, gross exports uh, at a bilateral uh, sectoral level. Now, when we're looking at GBC participation, and I think this leads into your second question, I think it's really important to look at both sides of uh, both, both ways in which that can commonly happen. That is to say, the FBA backward linkage route and the DVA interex forward linkage route. Um, you will see examples of people adding together uh, FBA and DVA interex and then dividing that by gross exports and saying that's a, an indicator of, of sort of total GPC linkage. I don't necessarily have a have a problem with that, um, but I, I think in the Wang Wei Zhu paper they tend to steer away uh, from from doing those uh, that, that that sort of calculation. But that that that's certainly uh, open. But we we do want to look at both sides of the ledger, and we'll see in the example uh, that I'm going to show you uh, uh, later on that. Um, uh, there are actually important cases where um, there can be a really different uh, uh, emphasis to GBC participation depending on which uh, direction of trade we're looking at, even between two countries. Okay, so so we will come back to that uh, uh, a, a little bit later. Then, of course, the million dollar question, you know, if I'm doing country work, how do I know whether my country is is strongly integrated into GBCs or weakly integrated? Well, you know, there, there's no simple answer to that. There, there's no magic number that says, you know, this is the dividing line between low and high. Um, when I'm doing country studies, uh, I do two things. I compare what I'm seeing in uh, the country that I'm interested in with what I'm seeing in some broadly comparable countries. That can be countries from a similar region, um, countries that have a similar level of income, or countries that have got a similar uh, pattern of specialization. All of those things go into the way in which we interact with uh, GVCs. Um, that, so that, that's one part of it. Then the second thing that I do is to look at changes in GVC participation uh, over time. OK, so we would expect if a country is becoming more integrated into GBCs that uh, these numbers would be going up systematically over time. OK, if they're going down, we know that something else is, is going on and we're going to need to, you know, dive into the data um, a little bit further. I, I, I will say India is an interesting case, um, both for uh, kind of the policy and political level uh, relationship to GVCs, which is, uh, I think, as I said in the lecture, a little different from what we see in uh, the East and Southeast Asian uh, countries. Um, but the second reason is that in the ADB uh, in input output table, when I was doing some work on this actually with a, a ADB about a year or so ago, uh, so using a slightly different version of the data from uh, the, the one that you guys have been using, um, India did turn out to have, uh, in some sectors, a really high level of uh, GVC involvement. And we all found that a little counterintuitive um, because the emphasis in India historically, I, I think, you know, it, it, it started to change. Uh, I'm not sure how much it's actually changed on, on the ground. But historically, there was a big emphasis on building uh, domestic supply chains. Um, so, yeah, I, I do have a query over, over the way some of the uh, uh, Indian data were looking uh, in, in the source. And if, if that's the country I were working on, I would be digging into it in, in great detail to try and find out where those uh, results come from. But short answer, there, there's no magic uh, number for what's strong participation, what's weak participation. Um, it's all relative. So finding a good comparator group and then doing comparisons over time, uh, I, I think, is the way to try and settle it. OK, there's a, a question that's come up in chat there. Why do some input output tables give similar but different values 
um, and, and that's it. How, how do we select the most suitable one? Yeah, my, you know, I'm a, I'm a data user. There, there are people uh, in this training who are data creators uh, who, who may have a better answer to this uh, than, than I do. Um, you will always see differences in multi-region in, input output tables. Um, there have been some exercises comparing the size of those differences. And my takeaway is that for uh, in particular larger countries, um, in particular higher income countries, and in particular at an aggregate level, uh, those differences are relatively small. The, the sorts of differences that you would expect to see from relatively minor uh, differences in, in statistical treatment. So, you know, that gives me a lot of comfort that, that we shouldn't be taking a research question and getting an answer using one input output table um, that would be different if we used a different data source. Um, so I, that, that's not something that I particularly lose, uh, lose sleep over. Now, as I said earlier, when I'm doing this work and I have to choose uh, which data source I, I want to use, I'm really driven by uh, countries, sectors, and time. Um, it's a very pragmatic choice. Um, the one that I seem to be working with most at the moment, and it's not just because they're in the room, um, but I tend to be working most with the, the ADB data set and of course the, now the extended data set uh, that they have with their partners. Um, I like the fact that it's very up to date. I like the fact uh, that it's got 35 sectors and it, it's pretty convenient to work with. I also, uh, for my own work, very much appreciate the fact that there is already a WWZ uh, decomposition that, that goes with it. So that, that saves sort of a lot of uh, analytical uh, uh, time. So that, that's probably as, as well uh, uh, as, as, as I can answer that question. Let, let me go now into, into chat. How do countries identify which part of a value chain to join in the first place? So how does comparative advantage manifest itself? How to model trade benefits arising from GBCs and not trade in general? How to model external shocks in a GBC framework? Okay, so we, we've got a question from a modeler. Um, I, I'm a modeler as well, so I, I love these uh, these kinds of questions. I, I'm not gonna descend into, into math and, and nitty gritty. Let me try and give uh, a, a, a sort of a broad uh, re response to that. So the, the first one, how do we identify which bit of a value chain uh, we're going to join? Well, uh, the answer comes in the next bit of the question. It's comparative advantage. But as I made the point in lecture one, it's a different definition of comparative advantage from the one that we may be used to. Um, you know, when I sat in grad school, which unfortunately was uh, some years ago now, um, we were talking about uh, comparative advantage in uh, 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 sort of manufactured goods versus primary production. Okay, so two massive uh, sectoral aggregates. When you're talking about value chains, uh, that sort of a discussion uh, doesn't really cut it anymore. The model is really trading in tasks. And, and you know, I think there are some nice examples. If we, if we think of electronic goods, um, you know, countries don't really have comparative advantage in electronics goods uh, anymore. It doesn't make any sense uh, to particularly talk about that. Countries have comparative advantage in particular tasks that are part of uh, the electronics uh, sector. So for instance, one country might have a comparative advantage in uh, assembly, and that's going to be driven by things like uh, the abundance of uh, labor. At, 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 a, at a reasonable uh, level of the, of the real wage. Um, a particular level of qualification may also be associated with that. On the flip side, we'll find other companies specialized in uh, design, research and development. Again, that's gonna be driven by human capital. So uh, the, the, the relative abundance of human capital. So we're still in this world where comparative advantage plays out uh, not only through technology differences, you know, Ricardian model, but also through uh, resource endowments, a hexero olean model, but the way in which we define how this plays out uh, changes fundamentally. So then uh, how to model the trade benefits arising from uh, GVCs. I, I actually think that we wanna flip that question around a bit. How do we model uh, trade changes coming from something else? Okay, so from, from a change in trade policy, from joining a trade agreement, something like that and then see what that does to GBCs. Um, because GBCs are really an outcome of a whole bunch of processes. I don't take the existence of a GBC as something exogenous. It's something that's developed endogenously 
uh, over time. So I think there's some interesting work uh, going on in that space at the moment. Uh, general equilibrium models are adding uh, GVC modules uh, to uh, to their work. So you can actually get a sense of how DVA, FVA and PDC change uh, when a country signs a trade agreement. OK, so that, that's a fantastic thing thing to know. And these results are really just starting to come out. It's very early days, but it, it's an intriguing uh, area of work. Then how to model external shocks in a GVC framework. I'm, I'm just going to answer that by saying that there's an emerging literature on the modeling of network shocks in economics. It's associated like so many other things uh, with Darren Asamoglu at uh, MIT. He's got a series of papers. Um, there's a big literature in physics and applied maths looking at stability of networks and the way in which shocks are transmitted. transmitted. I think people are starting to pick up that network, uh, that, that literature and bring it into economics. Um, I think it gets us a bit off topic if I give a detailed response to that, um, but there is certainly a literature out there uh, for those who are interested. Okay, so... Um, a uh, question about DVA intrex. If the re-export is to the origin country, would that be counted as a backward or a forward linkage? Um, that's actually counted as neither. That goes into a different bit of uh, domestic value added. There's a particular part of the aggregate that captures exactly that transaction that you're mentioning. So where stuff goes abroad, it gets processed and then it comes back in. So we don't need to worry about that um, as uh, part of DVA intrex. Um, how does new generation trade agreements affect the forming of GVCs or moving them from one country uh, uh, to member countries? That's a great question. I, I think it's one that we're starting to learn about as modelers are putting uh, GVC modules uh, into their trade models. Uh, just as we have trade creation and trade diversion as the result of any uh, uh, regional integration, any preferential uh, trade deal. There seems to me an intriguing possibility that we can actually have a, a kind of a value chain creation and value chain uh, 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 diversion as well as part of that process. Now, what worries me about regional integration, um, particularly in, in some regions, I think less so in East and Southeast Asia, but more so in uh, some other regions, is what it does to trade in intermediate inputs. So uh, the competitiveness of a value chain is really determined by the ability of the actors in that value chain to access world's best intermediate goods and services at reasonable prices. So trade diversion there has a massive cost uh, and it's more than we, we would see in typical models because it makes your downstream producers uh, less competitive. So, you know, yes, you can use an FTA to attract uh, value chains to your region and to your country. The problem is that unless input markets are working well in your region, um, you may actually be undercutting your own competitiveness when you do that. So it's a twist on the classic uh, trade creation, trade diversion argument. Those, of course, are welfare concepts. They're primarily to do with the behaviour of consumers. And what I'm suggesting is there's an aspect to it now of a kind of business to business uh, tra transaction. There, there's an intermediate uh, trade aspect to it that I think we also uh, need to try and keep in mind. OK, is it possible to extrapolate this already complex model from a sector to a product? For example, interpret a country's participation in the GVC for smartphones, given their level of integration in electronics. Um, I would be wary about doing that. So uh, uh, the data that we're using and that are, are always used for GVC uh, analysis are quite aggregate. So if you think of trade data, uh, the sort of customs data that we're used to dealing with, uh, at the international level, it's harmonized uh, at using the HS uh, six digit codes. That gets you about 5,000 uh, products. Now, uh, the issue comes when you want to put that together with information from the national accounts, that is to say the input output table, because that is much more aggregate. Um, the, the best job that, that you can do is really to get you know, 30 to 40 sectors, 40 is really pushing it. And, and 35, I, I think, is is the most uh, that can be sort of feasibly done. So that means that you can say an awful lot about electronics, 
but you can't, at least as a data proposition, say anything about a particular product within electronics. All you can do is talk about the sector. Now, of course, if you want to go into it from secondary sources and qualitative sources and say, well, you know, I can find out that most of uh, my country's production and exports in the electronic sector is in fact smartphones, then well and good, you, you can start uh, talking uh, about that. It is going to be a relatively special uh, case, but there certainly are cases uh, where that applies. So just to caveat in terms of uh, what uh, what you say about the uh, the, the the data, um, but you certainly can try and do more with uh, other other um, um, sources. So there's a question again about uh, DVA interex. Will it give us a space to work only with DVA? Well, DVA interex is part of DVA. So this is domestic. This is value added that is added domestically. So we we sum it up along with the other elements of uh, DVA. And if you go back to the WWZ uh, 2013 paper, you can see what all of the other uh, elements are and, 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 and get a sense of uh, the sorts of transactions uh, that, that they're capturing. Um, DVA interacts is particularly interesting because it captures uh, this kind of production sharing that we're interested in. Um, the other elements of DVA, um, a, a, a little bit less so. Um, I would say for policy purposes, uh, how much do I really care that uh, DVA is coming from uh, final goods rather than intermediate goods? Uh, I, I've never come across an instance where I'm particularly interested in that. That doesn't mean that there is no such instance, um, it just means that I haven't uh, yet come across it. Okay, uh, next question from the chat. Will trade and value added be separated by ownership in the future to avoid... Okay, let, let me answer that one first. Uh, there is an ongoing project, so OECD and its partners are trying to do a next version of uh, TIVA in which they separate out firms by domestic and foreign ownership. I think APEC uh, TIVA is also trying to go in the same direction. Um, I think that's a fascinating area to go in. It's terribly complicated uh, to try and get all the data to line up. It's, it's extremely ambitious. Um, but but I, I think we're all waiting to see that, uh, that data. I, I should say, once you've understood the basic insight of trade and value added, um, you can split things up in any number of ways. If you have a adequate statistics, uh, not only can you split firms up by whether or not they're domestic or foreign owned, you can split them up by whether they're owned by men or women. Okay, so one thing that we know very little about is the gender dimension of value chain trade. And if there's a country somewhere that has actually collected uh, this data, and of course many don't um, for, for very uh, unfortunate reasons, but if someone has got the data where they can look comprehensively at the pattern of ownership and match that up with everything else that it's got to match, then we can start seeing exactly how uh, women are participating in value chains, which is a, a crucial uh, policy question going forward. So uh, then to avoid double tariffs, should countries move to tax the value added content only? Um, that's an interesting question. I'm, I'm not sure that I have a perspective uh, on that. You know, this has come up uh, for those of you who work on services uh, that the European Commission and, and one person in particular at the European Commission has been very active in pushing an agenda called Mode 5, uh, which is basically to say that you should get a uh, some form of rebate uh, for the fact that your goods are made up to a substantial uh, extent of, of uh, services. Um, my impression is that as a negotiating uh, prospect, that hasn't really uh, caught on to any great extent. Um, so I, I could be wrong about that and, and, and you know, could be surprised in, in a few years. Um, my feeling though is that administering that uh, would be pretty complicated, but I, I don't really have a fixed uh, point of view on that. Okay, we've got a question about gravity. I'll, I'll quickly answer it, so it's a little off topic. Uh, with the democratization of e-commerce, should we expect the distance variable and gravity modeling to become less important over time? Um, there is evidence that e-commerce uh, reduces the effective distance. So there's a, a, a famous paper by Marcelo Olariaga and co-authors on uh, the effect of eBay. Um, there's another one that's recently come out on the use of machine translation. Um, so, so yes, all of these sorts of things tend to reduce the effective distance. Um, having said that, it's still going to be an awfully long way uh, from zero. Okay, let me see. 
Okay. Uh, if I want to measure regional value chains, would the decomposition in PDC and DBA index be useful? Um, actually, all of the decomposition that we've talked about would be useful. So DVA index is going to tell you uh, uh, about forward linkages. FBA is going to tell you about backward linkages. And then you simply break it down um, according to the groups of countries that you're interested in. Um, so in the companion paper that I've got, uh, looking at uh, GBC linkages between uh, uh, Asia and Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, we group countries together into, into different aggregates. And, and so you can absolutely uh, do that. And uh, you can distinguish intra-regional value chains from those with a more global uh, kind of dimension. And some, some of the agencies have done uh, good, good work on that. So that, that's absolutely uh, feasible. Uh, do we look at exports or also consider trade and value added in imports in trade and value added analysis? Um, okay, so th there's a point being made about the discrepancies between reported imports and reported exports. All of that is reconciled in a multi-region input output table. That's one of the steps that the statisticians go through to make sure, because the, the, the table has to balance. You, you know, you have to have rows and columns uh, add, adding up and uh, that there are important symmetries uh, that need to be maintained. So part of that exercise is to uh, use statistical techniques to uh, 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 reconcile imports and exports. So that, that gets dealt with. Um, it's more common to look at trade in value added from the export perspective. Uh, why? Because in, po in policy circles, we're nearly always talking about exports, um, but you can flip everything. Okay, you can certainly flip, flip everything around and look at the value added origin of imports if that is of interest to you. Um, the techniques are, are simply the mirror image of everything that we're looking at here. Okay, in a scenario of limited resources, should countries focus their efforts on promoting sectors where the value added uh, DVA is high or should they try to diversify and support sectors with a small DVA? Um, I don't think there's any answer to that. Um, I, I would say more generally, there isn't a particularly good case um, for states to choose uh, which sectors they want to be bigger and which sectors they want to be smaller um, at all. The historical record of doing that um, outside uh, some well-known special cases has generally been uh, pretty bad. Uh, the agenda as I see it is to put in place a business environment and an investment climate such that our domestic firms can be competitive, they can turn towards the outside and they can have the discipline of uh, dealing with uh, export competition. And uh, once we do that, it's really a business decision uh, as to which businesses and which sectors grow. And of course, there are deep economic determinants of that from factor abundance uh, to technology. Um, but I think we know from recent and not so recent history that uh, uh, playing around uh, too much with those forces uh, can do more harm than good. Okay, how do you think the role of NTMs enter into GVCs? Do you think that developing countries with poor regulations are locked out of GVCs? How would this affect the prominence of GVCs? Yeah, good, good question. Um, NTMs, I, I think are critical. Um, there are two reasons that they're critical. One is the tariffs everywhere now are pretty low. In, in historical perspective, tariffs are basically low. So really for any type of trade that, we, that we're talking about, it's mostly about NTMs, okay? Um, and that goes for GBC trade as much as uh, uh, any other uh, uh, type of trade. But there's a particular type of NTM uh, that I think is really important for GBCs, and that's uh, technical regulations and product standards. So part of being able to join a GBC, uh, especially in manufacturing, but also in some cases in services, is that you produce a product that is interoperable with everything else that is being used by the GVC. So think of it this way. If, if I've got a lead firm in a GVC that is making smartphones, it's no help to anyone if I make the most competitive screens in the world, but they don't work with all of the other components in the company's smartphone, okay? So I need to satisfy uh, the product standards around screens so that uh, the lead firm can pick up my output, combine it with everything else and get a product that works. 
Okay, so this type of NTM becomes really critical uh, for joining GBCs. And I think we do see a concern in many developing countries um, that because of their difficulties in, uh, in uh, dealing with uh, issues like product standards and technical regulations, they do feel uh, somewhat locked out of uh, GVCs. Now, I think that's a very real uh, concern that they have. Uh, dealing with it, of course, is a massive and very broad-based capacity building program uh, designed to build national quality infrastructure. Um, these efforts have been going on for a long time. Um, I think there is a really good case now uh, to, to double down on that and to really intensify those efforts. Okay, next question. Uh, I'm afraid I can't read that one. Uh, how to interpret one country's backward and forward GVC to the region in a particular sector while y-axis is the share of FBA and DBA to total exports in the region? Uh, I'm not sure I totally understand that, I'm, I'm afraid. I, I think we'll, we'll look at the next section at, at some very simple ways of presenting this information graphically. So I, I'm uh, someone who always favours simplicity in, in graphs. Uh, so, so, you know, getting getting uh, a lot of information, sure, but doing doing it in a way that it remains readable. So we'll perhaps address that uh, in the next part of the session. Okay, uh, New Zealand is not in the input output table, but Australia is. Uh, look, I'm I'm Australian, and Mia is from New Zealand. Um, so you you've uh, stepped on a diplomatic landmine uh, here. I actually don't know the reason. Uh, I I would assume it's related to economic size and uh, and and size of trade. Um, but I I don't actually know the answer to that. Someone from ADB can can perhaps uh, elaborate. Uh, can we look at a practical example? Yes, we'll do that uh, shortly afterwards uh, in the next session. And now I've got a question about do trade deficits matter uh, in the global value chain model? Um, the short answer is no, they don't. Um, really, the only reason a trade deficit matters is that you have to finance it. It's a financial problem. It's, it's really got nothing to do uh, with trade or trade policy. Um, politicians love talking about the trade deficit in terms of winning and, and losing. Um, you know, I, I run a massive trade deficit with my grocery store uh, because every time I go in there, you know, I buy a bunch of groceries and they don't buy any of my uh, economic consulting services. Um, does that mean I'm losing? No, I get great food and I get to stay healthy and, and all this kind of thing. Um, so bilateral def deficits uh, really are just quite quite irrelevant uh, to, to trade policy. Then, then as I say, the, the macroeconomic deficit, um, I think only becomes relevant when it's of a size uh, that there are real issues about financing and the, the stability of the macro economy uh, based on that. But that's getting us uh, outside um, our, our comfort zone. Um, there's a question uh, about uh, technology changes in, in the model. So, yeah, someone's picked up on the idea that the Leontief input-output model that we were looking at assumes constant technology. Um, that has important implications uh, for the way in which that model used to be uh, used. That, that is to say, to actually sort of plan out uh, what, what places we're going to produce to try and think, you know, what, what extra output do I need from every sector in order to produce a, 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 bit, a bit more lead or, or, or a bit, you know, a couple of extra cars or whatever. Um, we, we don't tend to use input output tables in that way uh, in, anymore. Um, I, I don't have a, a strong view on what uh, the constant technology uh, assumption does in our context. I tend to think not much um, because we are only ever looking in a counterfactual uh, kind of a world. So we are, you know, yes, there are small changes in technology. We, we're not looking at long time periods, you know, 50 or 100 years. Uh, we're looking at short time periods. So technological change uh, is hopefully fairly minimal and we're not performing any operations uh, that are really uh, 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 where, where the technological uh, assumption really plays a key role. So I, I don't necessarily use uh, lose any sleep over that. Um, okay, one more question. Um, how to find out which products, uh, GVCs, a country should join and how does policy play a role in making such a decision? Well, uh, that's a good question because I don't think policy should be making that decision. 
um, that is really a decision for individual businesses. They have all of the information uh, to know whether they're good at what they do and what they need to be better at that. I think the role of policy is to ensure that businesses have what they need. Uh, that is to say they can access inputs, goods and services from world markets at good prices. They can move goods and services in and out of their economies quickly and at reasonable cost. They can access financing at reasonable cost and on reasonable conditions. Uh, they can uh, uh, start a business without undue cost or, or undue uh, bureaucracy. Uh, they can build a factory, they can get water connected, they can get electricity, all these sorts of things. So a classic sort of business support uh, investment climate uh, kind of agenda is where I think uh, policy comes in. Okay, so there's a question about larger and more productive firms. So the data that we've got don't go down to the firm level. Okay, so uh, th this is all aggregate stuff. We, we can't see anything uh, about large firms or small firms. Now, uh, again, another project that, that I'm aware of, uh, uh, I believe it's the, the OECD is experimenting this with this, is to break out uh, the TIVA data uh, based on uh, company size. OK, which I think is a, a fascinating thing to do. And what we will see, because we already basically know what we're going to see as a first approximation, is as the question says, um, direct exports are going to be largely accounted for by uh, larger, more productive firms. But we're going to see this huge universe of uh, second tier suppliers, which are going to be small and medium firms. And actually what we're going to see is that those guys uh, indirectly export uh, a, a huge uh, proportion of, of their output. So they're selling it on to bigger firms. Those bigger firms mix it with a bunch of other stuff and then export it. So classic TIVA problem. The question always is, can I get the data to split out firms by ownership and thereby have uh, a more disaggregated uh, multi-region input output table? Okay, transfer pricing and intra-firm trade. Uh, that's getting us a, a bit outside, I, I think, uh, where, where we're at. Um, uh, certainly all of that matters from a tax perspective. Um, from an input-output pers perspective, um, we're going off the national accounts and trade data, so it's the best quality data uh, that we have. That is to say, not immune from these problems, um, but as robust as it can be. Um, is it possible to link GVC participation indicators to issues related to governance and power dynamics within GVCs? Or does sectoral aggregation blur that kind of understanding? Um, I won't talk about power dynamics because it's, it's not, my, uh, not my area. Um, uh, you know, governance, I, I think, is, is an interesting one. I, I think the way you're asking the question suggests that it's really a firm level relationship. So again, we can't see it with sectoral data. It doesn't mean it's there. Uh, that, that, that doesn't mean it's not there and it doesn't mean that it's not worth studying. Um, so there are, so Gary Jareffi and, and his team at uh, Duke University study all of this stuff. Uh, you know, that, that, that's what they specialise in. I think they do excellent, excellent work. Um, so all of that important to understand, but it's not something that we can easily get at with uh, our methodology. Okay. Uh, SDA research, I'm not aware of, of that. I can't speak to it. Maybe uh, someone from ADB uh, can speak to that. And I think uh, we've gotten to the end of the, oh no, there's, I see there's one hand up. Let me just, okay. I actually can't see the name of the person who's got their hand up. Um, but if you have your hand up at the moment, please feel free to take the, oh, it's uh, an, uh, an Iban, so please, uh, feel free to take the floor and uh, ask your question. Uh, un please un unmute your yourself. Uh, thank you, uh, Ben. Thank I, you. Uh, uh, I got the answer actually. I put there in the chat box earlier. Uh, but my question was actually uh, from the you know existing uh, database or of the exercise on this trade on value added uh, active uh, you know. Uh, is it possible to comment on the technology content of uh, trade that is going on from one country to another uh, crossing borders? Uh, so that is what, and uh, maybe yes, uh, you, can, you can comment on. 
Sure, happy to comment on that. I mean, I, I think it's it's an important issue. There are all sorts of indicators around about the technology content of, of trade. Um, again, the level of aggregation that we're working at in a trade and value added context, it generally makes that pretty difficult um, other than to do um, in, in a pretty intuitive sense. You, you know, we, we can look at a sector like textiles and apparel and, and we can say, OK, if I'm comparing textiles and apparel and electrical and optical equipment, it's pretty fair to say that electrical and optical equipment is at a higher level of technology. OK, that's a that that that's a fairly uh, straightforward comparison. Um, but no, we can't do it in, in a systematic way that uh, that people have done with some of the uh, product classifications uh, that are available in uh, in the trade data. Um, so that that's again possibly an area uh, for more research in in the future. But but I think you know if I can maybe kind of round up uh, some of these questions that we've had towards the end. Um, you know we've we've been here to study one thing. OK, one one methodology um, and obviously it's all that I've talked about um, that is, that doesn't mean that I'm saying that it's the only methodology that we should use to talk about value chains. There's a whole host of methodologies that are useful and interesting and important when it comes to talking about value chains. That can be everything from uh, looking at uh, trade data, that is to say customs data in different and important ways. So there's some work at the, at the World Bank and at UNIDO uh, where they've done that. Um, it can be case study work, firm level case studies, um, thinking of work by Gary Jareffi and his co-authors and uh, also by Patrick Lowe. Uh, he, he did a, a great book uh, where he did firm level uh, case studies of the, on the use of services in uh, value chains. And uh, so I, I think there are many different ways that we can get at the areas uh, that uh, that that we're interested in, and so I would encourage you. You know, if this is is an area that, that interests you, I, I think it's important to try and master some of the different methodologies. So definitely, you know, have a have a go at the material that, that we've looked at here. I can see that people are very engaged with and with it, which is uh, obviously hugely gratifying. But once you feel good about this. Uh, I would continue on this process uh, of what you're doing by saying, you know, what are the limitations on this? What can't I do? And what other methodologies might be out there to help me answer uh, some related questions? OK, so there, there are just a couple of last uh, questions here. We, we will break uh, ju just for 15 minutes in, in a couple of minutes. Um, so can the results be used for data driven trade policy making? Um, the answer is absolutely. Um, so. Uh, well, let me say ab absolutely, but gee, we've got to be careful. OK, so uh, you remember in one of the lectures I showed you a graph of domestic value added and foreign value added, and, and I showed you uh, that the left hand side was in percentage terms and the right hand side was in dollar terms. Now, I, I've had the experience of sitting in front of policymakers talking about this stuff and they say, OK, great, like I, I, I get domestic value added, I get foreign value added. And basically, Ben, aren't you telling me that I should try and maximise my domestic value added? And I say, no, actually, that's that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, that is really intuitive. That That is a, a, an obvious implication to take away from it. But it turns out that it's the wrong one. We want to grow the sector. We, we want to grow a sector. We want to grow the economy as quickly as possible. And the evidence to date uh, indicates that the best way of doing that is actually by treating uh, foreign value added and domestic value added as complements uh, rather than substitutes. That is to say, we let in uh, inputs from uh, abroad, that is goods and services uh, that, that we're importing. And I think this is something that has yet to be absorbed at a policy level. And I don't think that I'm picking on developing countries when I say that. My, my country is one of the worst offenders at, at the moment. Um, we have not learned that when you put tariffs on stuff like steel, you affect every value chain that uses steel. And, and of course, we're seeing that now in the economic data, um, but nonetheless, the policy was put in place. So we certainly can use all of this uh, to inform policy making, uh, to provide an evidentiary basis uh, for policy making, but it's hard work. Um, so we, we've got to master all the material, and then we've also got to sell it uh, to, to people who may or may not uh, be starting on uh, uh, the, the, the same page. 
Okay, last question, and then we'll uh, we, we'll we'll uh, take a fifteen minute break. Um, if I want to know my home country's involvement in GVC trade, should I look at it in dollar terms or in percent of gross exports? Uh, I, I think the answer is both. Okay, so when we're looking across sectors, uh, let me take an example like Bangladesh. I'm I'm using it as an example because I'm doing some work on on Bangladesh at, at the moment. Um, Bangladesh's exports are accounted for, uh, I think it's 86% by uh, the textiles and apparel sector. So I can calculate GVC indicators in percentage terms uh, for all of the other sectors. I'm, I'm using the ADB data, there are 35 sectors. I can, I can look in, in the material that ADB is produced and I can calculate the percentages. But those percentages don't necessarily mean very much. What, what, what does it mean to have uh, you know, a, a forward linkage of 20% in a sector that only supplies 2% of the country's gross exports. Okay, it's, it's, it's interesting because there's obviously some uh, value chain activity going on there, but it, from an economy-wide point of view, I may be missing something uh, very important. So my answer is always to do both because you certainly don't want to write a report where you've talked about all 35 sectors in percentage terms and drawn conclusions, and then someone comes along and says, hang, hang on a second, one of those sectors accounts for 86% of our exports, and really we don't care about any, any of the others. We want to know about that one specifically. Um, so that, that that's the short answer uh, to, to do both. So look, uh, thanks very much, uh, everyone. We, we've reached uh, I, I guess it's uh, 9.15 Bangkok time. So in the agenda, we've got a 15 minute pause uh, program just to, to enable people to, to, to have a glass of water, stretch their legs. Um, so we will reconvene at uh, 9.30 uh, Bangkok time. Uh, Wittata, please correct me if I got the time difference wrong just then. I'm, I'm hoping I, I got it right. Um, but in, in any case, we'll reconvene in 15 minutes. Thanks everyone for a really very active and enjoyable conversation. Yes, Ben, you are right. Now it's 9.15 Bangkok time. So we're back in at 9.30. OK, thanks.
Okay, thanks everyone. I, I think we might make a start again. So we've we've got about an hour uh, left uh, in, in this session. Um, we, we've got a couple of things that, that we can do. So I'm really grateful to you all uh, for the questions uh, that, that you asked us then. They're, they're all uh, really fantastic questions. I, I can see that people have engaged with the material and gotten a lot out of it. So that that's, uh, you know, that that's a great feeling for, for me. So I, I really do, uh, uh, I, I, I really do appreciate it. Um, I, my thanks also to my colleague from uh, ADB who I saw in chat uh, answering some of the uh, detailed questions on uh, the multi-region uh, in, in input output table. So, so I think that's uh, really very helpful for everyone. I see that there is, uh, I think one hand uh, still up, that's uh, Sornok. Is there a question uh, there still? No, sounds, oh, oh uh, Samantha's hand is up. Yes, please. Okay, so Sonok, did you want to ask a question? Uh, hi, Professor, uh, can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Uh, I had a question in the sense that uh, uh, yesterday in the lecture you mentioned that uh, exports like the, the GDP is usually calculated through the value added method and so it is directly not uh, compatible with trade statistics which records the gross invoices. So in so in the GDP uh, we have the X minus M component. So it's so only consumption, government and investment. These three terms are calculated on a value added basis and the other two they are sort of no, so I, mean, I, I was talking about uh, exports and imports that we get from customs. Um, so, so the export and import data that, that, that we get from customs, uh, of course, do uh, do do not uh, net out in intermediate input input use. Um, in uh, when we're thinking of the the national accounts identity that you just mentioned, um, that that's the uh, consumption basis for measuring it. Okay, so. Uh, adding up value added is one of the alternative uh, definitions of the national accounts identity. So they're two separate things uh, in terms of the national accounts. Now, having said that, there are all sorts of different ways in which exports and imports are recorded uh, in, in our accounts. Um, it's in the balance of payments, uh, for example, that's one set of statistics. But for trade policy purposes, we rarely use those. We, we most often use uh, the statistics that come out of customs, the reason being that they're disaggregated both by partner and uh, by uh, commodity. So that, that's what I was getting to there. So it's, it's not a, a sort of a, a you know, a, a gloss on the national accounts identity. It's just being careful to think about the national accounts identity in, uh, in, in, in two uh, different and complementary ways. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so uh, before we go any further, just to help me plan time, um, I'd like to get a sense of who was able to have a bit of a go at the empirical exercise. 
So if we can do another show of hands again, that, that is to say using your hands up indicator, can you please put your hand up if uh, you got pretty well through the empirical exercise and are prepared to talk about it a little? Okay, that's pretty good. I, I can see that some some people got, got through it. Probably, uh, I, I guess, about a, a quarter of people are, are feeling comfortable with it. So look, what, what I think we might do is is maybe, uh, you know, my, my discussion questions, uh, I, I think we've worked through uh, most of them, you know, given the, the questions that uh, you all asked. So, you know, let's, we, we've worked through most of the lecture one uh, questions and some of the lecture two questions. But there's just a couple that I wanted to focus in on in lecture two, because in some of the material that I, I've looked through people's answers, it just seems to me that there are uh, perhaps some points of confusion um, in, in a couple of areas. So uh, this is getting into the more technical uh, material. Um, again, I'm not gonna be asking you to do math on a whiteboard or anything like that. It's really just the, the, intu the intuition and the concepts uh, that we wanna get straight. But a, a really big question, you know, when, when we think about uh, two of the key matrices uh, that we were looking at in uh, in uh, lecture two, there was matrix A, which was, the, you remember, the matrix of technical uh, coefficients, and then there was matrix B, which was the Leontief inverse. Who can give me a, a good intuitive explanation of what the difference between those two things is? I'm seeing a ton of hands up. Is that to answer this question or the previous uh, poll? If it's to answer this question, I, I will just pick someone in, in a second. Okay, hands are still up. So let's uh, let's ask uh, let's ask uh, Preeti. Both the direct and indirect effects of it, and uh, the matrix of the input coefficients is basically capturing only the direct. Yeah. That's that's exactly right. So um um yeah the, the 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 key thing is that matrix A gets direct input use from other sectors. Okay, so you you, you can imagine how we build up matrix A, right? Like we we go around to firms and we survey them and we ask them basically how much stuff did they buy from other sectors and we we tally all that up across sectors we do some statistical magic and that gives us a table that looks something like well well it, it looks like ax okay because it's multiplied by uh by by the, the the quantity produced but uh that's where we get the matrix of technical coefficients so it's this this kind of one step input output relationship then the magic of matrix B, the, the famous Leontief inverse, is that it doesn't just get those first stage relationships, it gets all of the other stages as well. So if I'm a computer manufacturer and I buy stuff from a financial services company, that goes into matrix A. But the financial services company, in order to supply stuff to me, might buy stuff from uh, a professional services company, like a, a lawyer or, or an accountant. And then that lawyer or accountant uh, may buy a computer from an electrical uh, and, and optical equipment seller. So we get all of these connections down the line. And to me, the kind of amazing results of the Leontief inverse is that with some really simple mathematics, we can actually capture it all, okay? And so that's the crucial kind of uh, insight that actually powers the whole thing uh, that we're doing with trading value added. It's that we're not just looking at uh, kind of a point to point transaction. We're looking at all of the relationships of exchange of value added that go into that transaction. OK, so it's a really uh, crucial point, I, I think, for us to try and get uh, our, our heads uh, around. Now, I'm going to flip a question back to you. You know, some, some of you asked in the previous session 
you know, is this kind of thing useful for policy purposes? And and I kind of said, yes, it is. And I, I gave some examples and some thoughts from my end. But let me turn it over to you. I mean, you all are working in policy or you're, you're studying, you're academics. Um, what sort of use can you imagine making of this approach to measuring trade in value added and thinking about global value chains in your professional work? What, what sort of research questions can you think about answering? Um, what sort of uh, policy questions do you think you might be able to inform? Does anyone want to chip in with that? I'm really keen to, to hear what you think. So please, please do raise your hand if you'd like to answer. Yes, Sornok, please. Uh, hi, I had a question. Uh, this is, I think this. I also uh, mentioned this question in my assignment. Uh, I'm from India, and from uh, India's perspective, like there is, there has been sort of a, a prolonged stagnation when it comes to a manufacturer's exports in world markets. Like we, like India commands about a bit less than two percent of world manufacturers, and this hasn't really changed since the mid 1990s. Uh, so what I want to know is, like, while trading. Uh, while integrating into uh, like the GVC networks, uh, is it is it does it make any sense for say a country like India to look at the DVA component while trading with other countries? In general, I I I understand why it might not be that important since the FVA com com component also helps to stimulate exports and then maybe enhance the quality and everything. But for a country that is not really being able to upgrade along value value chains, is the DVA component something that should be looked at? Well, let me maybe reframe uh, the, the, the question a, a, a little bit. I mean, is it that India hasn't been successful in joining and upgrading in value chains? Or is it that it hasn't really tried? Um, I would actually argue that it's much more the second case. Um, so if we look at policy settings in India versus a country like Vietnam, um, which is really using a, a heavily uh, value chain driven uh, model um, in, in India, and I, I, I should disclose, you know, for family reasons, I spend a lot of time in, in, in India and sort of thinking uh, about India, reading about India. Um, you know, I, I when I talk to business people there and the, the Confederation of Indian Industry and, and all these sorts of guys, they're incredibly focused on the domestic market. Um, so the outward oriented nature of the growth strategy that we saw in the Tigers um, and, and we see now in, in Vietnam and in, in uh, of course China, um, it, it certainly exists in, in India. You know, you can find export oriented uh, businesses, export oriented parts of the economy. But I, I wouldn't say that it's a social choice in, in the way that it is in, uh, in some other countries. So uh, it, it could be, of course. Um, and there was the Make in India campaign. I mean, the, the whole point of Make in India, uh, at least as I understood it, was for India to become a manufacturing and a uh, within global value chains. That that was that was very much uh, the objective. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get into a discussion of uh, you know any governments and and what they have or, or haven't done, but I, I do think it's worthwhile looking at these sorts of data. Uh, to see, uh, you know, whether there's an indication that India's GVC participation is changing in a good way uh, over recent years. Is it is it getting greater? But I I think your your point about DVA is is actually quite an interesting one. Um, you know, I, I think I, I think in India that is a classic case where policymakers do focus on DVA and have always uh, focused on DVA. And so I think part of the battle that we've got in the world of value chain development is to try and convince people to see things a little bit differently. Um, and, and of course, there are the examples out there. You know, there, there's Vietnam, rapid economic growth, uh, fastest rate of poverty reduction ever recorded in human history, uh, all, all these kinds of uh, su successes. And, you know, they can be linked in different ways uh, to its its development strategy and to its use of value chains. Um, but, but, you know, at, at that point, we start getting into a well, at best, a political economy, at, at worst, a, a political uh, uh, discussion about how all of that works. But I think that's certainly something um, looked at. I, I, I should say, you know, lest it be thought that, that I'm saying something particular about uh, India, I, I think 
the uh, tendency that I'm noting to focus on the domestic market is true for any large economy. Um, it's, it's true here in the United States as well. Um, I, I think China stands out because it was less true during their, their stage of, of rapid growth. They were very much uh, focused on export markets. Um, but may, maybe I can leave that there. there. There's a question that's come up in, in uh, chat. If I'm interested in running a regression model or a gravity model to estimate the factors determining GVC backward and forward dissipation, uh, what points should I pay attention to? Well, firstly, again, a big caveat about gravity, make sure you and find a specific gravity model uh, for trade and value added. They are there in the literature, not always easy to work with, um, but uh, but uh, you, you you do need to, to make sure that you do that. Um, in terms of regression model more generally, well, I, I mean, it's a very open area. There's uh, some research that's been done, but the, the field is by no means uh, densely populated. So what I would suggest is looking at the factors that we can reasonably believe would influence these sorts of processes. And in my view, they're generally going to be related to factors around what we could broadly call the business environment. So the ability of firms to access resources, to access human capital, um, to access financial capital, um, and to move goods and services across borders. All, all, all of these sorts of, of, of aspects, I think, go into the value chain and gender. And there is some interesting research to be done to look at the determinants of value chain participation. Um, I, I should say too, I think there's a lot we can learn from the qualitative studies, um, these sorts of Gary Jareffi uh, and, and, and his team uh, studies that I was mentioning before. Um, I see that Ra Rahul's hand is up. I can hand over to you if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi Ben. Uh, yeah, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Ben, my uh, my uh, um, I'm I'm really responding to your first question in terms of you know the areas of research interest. So basically, um, I'm a GTAP user, uh, so I have been uh, sort of working uh, with CG models, and I would be quite interested to know the potential of working with these kind of models, particularly to try and understand the possible reorientation of GVCs in the light of COVID, particularly you know, in automobile sector, for example, because that that's one of my area of interest. Also, because uh, quite a few years back, I sort of published an, uh, an article on India's involvement in GVCs, where we did find some evidence of GVC participation, uh, particularly in uh, the automobile auto parts sector, more specifically. Now, obviously, auto parts is not exactly disaggregated at the moment, mm -hmm. as, as I noted in uh, MRIO or in the um, other um, uh, GVC uh, data at the moment, uh, but that's that's something which I actually have in mind. And I would also like to sort of make a comment on Make in India because that's again another area of research that I'm doing. And uh, some preliminary results that we have reached at least looking at the tariff impact uh, of Make in India because there have been some reactive tariff set up to uh, you know protect the domestic industries for the time being. And that shows that uh, yes, uh, exports definitely uh, haven't picked up. So exports have suffered, although, you know, domestic output might have picked up, but uh, exports have suffered. So, yeah, thanks. Yep, that, that, that's yeah. Right. So uh, let me follow up there. I, I think, you know, on the, well, you, you mentioned CGE. I, I'm I'm trying to to, to sort of get, get out of uh, CGE vo vocabulary. So let's uh, computational models, uh, which I think is a broader set. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is that when we say CG, everyone thinks of GTAP, and uh, you know there's a big movement in the in, in, in the academic literature. Of course, no, nobody much has ever used uh, GTAP, and and that that is even less true now than than, than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so people are using what are called new quantitative trade models. So they're general equilibrium models, um, typically uh, a lot more pared back uh, than, than GTAP, but with a really close relationship between theory and data, and, and incorporating all sorts of uh, nice stuff that, that, that we believe uh, about the global economy. So for that class of models, so GTAP plus all, all these other things, um, you can absolutely use this to talk about value chains. Um, I, I have my own uh, general equilibrium model, one, one of these new uh, generation models, uh, where we can, can see very clearly uh, the impact of a change of trade costs 
on uh, changes in domestic value-added, foreign value-added, pure double counting, uh, and all the relevant ratios, forward linkages, backward linkages, all these sorts of things uh, that we're interested in. So I think that's a, a great area of, of research, and it's absolutely possible to do that uh, with, with uh, GTAP, if that's your preferred uh, uh, framework. Now, um, in, in terms of uh, the, other, the, the other parts of, of the question, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, you, you know the, the the Indian example is is indeed an interesting one, and and I think you know the the symmetry that you're talking about that uh, trade taxes on imports tend to act as a trade on exports is something that uh, we're all well aware of through the the learner symmetry. Um, but I do feel that we can't uh, state it enough. And it becomes really crucial in a value chain context because in a value chain context, even more than in uh, a standard trade context, policymakers are really focused on exports. And you know, in intuitively, many people think that if I'm if I want to export more, I should protect my domestic market. And of course, you know, le learner symmetry plus cost of inputs suggests that you're actually doing your final goods producers a great disservice uh, if you protect at least some parts uh, of, of the economy. So I think using modelling or using uh, data to try and make that point uh, more clearly is uh, a very valuable uh, thing, thing to do. Um, I've got a, a question here from Jacqueline. Hi, hi Jacqueline from uh, Geneva. Um, so in terms of adding value, you know, how much value does the sector add to my, to my country? I mean, that's kind of a different question, right? That, that's just going straight back to the national accounts and, and looking at the value added of my sector relative to total value added, which is GDP. So, um, you know, that, that I would distinguish from the question about uh, the, the balance between domestic and foreign value added. Um, to me, it's really important to think about the overall size of the sector. Um, and that is not just a function of domestic value added. It's, it's a function of uh, the sum of all of these things. So it, again, think of the Thai auto example that I gave in the slides, where you see a small decrease in the percentage of domestic value added. And far from being a disaster for the Thai auto industry, it's actually in, in indicating a huge success uh, as in dollar figures, the amount of exports goes up many, many fold. So, uh, you know, when we talk about the value of a sector to the economy, we're not just talking about uh, its contribution to value added in, in a direct uh, uh, sort of sense. We're also talking about the jobs it creates. We're talking about the exports that it produces, all of these sorts of things. Um, so again, I think if we're doing a sector study, uh, we bring all of these points into play. It's a complex discussion as to as to how we see all of these uh, uh, working out in particular contexts. Okay. Okay, great. Look, I, I think that's uh, that's uh, the list of questions that that I've got. Oh, one one more. So, uh, what model do you suggest to evaluate uh, COVID? on uh, bilateral trade analysis. Uh, I feel COVID is an ad hoc shock and data availability for two quarters limits our exercise. Still, can I suggest any method? Uh, well, you know, that that's the million dollar question. Everyone wants us to do that at, at the moment. Um, in, in my own work, I haven't been brave enough to try and do it, which should probably tell you something about the answer uh, that I'm about to give. Um, I think it is very difficult to be anything other than speculative as to what COVID has done to trade costs. So, you know, in a, in a, mo in a modern trade model, um, pretty much every shock comes down to a change in trade costs. That, that, that's what's driving uh, the, the movement from the observed equilibrium to a counterfactual uh, e equilibrium, whether, whether this is a value chain model or something else. Um, and I think we simply don't know enough about what COVID has done to trade costs because, as you say, there is this lag of uh, data. Um, if I were to invest serious time and resources in this, I would probably try and pick uh, one sector where we have some external data on something like transport costs and we, we can see how transport costs changed over time or we can make some very good uh, assumption about how they might have changed. So the, the modelling technique is, is all there, whether you use a gravity model or whether you use uh, one of these new generation 
uh, computational models, um, that the technology is, is absolutely there. The difficulty is in uh, defining uh, the, the, the shock. Um, okay, so uh, Nicolas would like to express his thoughts about GBC measures and policy making. That, that's great. I, sorry, I didn't see your hand up, but um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, I'm, I'm happy to hear you. Hi, can you hear me well, Ben? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for the excellent, excellent lecture. Oh, so just, uh, I used to work in, in policy making in international trade in, here in Mexico. Well, question because many of our commerce is actually with United States, mm -hmm. but we apply some issue. We apply some preferential programs for tariffs from tier countries, exactly because many of our inputs come from is Asia. So I, I will put first on my list of further research is tariff design because we have the NAFTA uh, now the USMCA, but then maybe some of the inputs you have are, are outside your 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 trade agreements, and that's the case for us. Uh, for for example, China is our second biggest um, exporter of from the perspective of Mexico importer, but we don't have a trade a trade deal. So mm -hmm. that's one point that I, I would like to, to investigate. Another one will be trade facilitation measures because uh, now trade facilitation, I think, uh, I, I make the, the question before that where you put the efforts, uh, but from a government perspective, it's difficult question because you, you need to make free the market, but then, you have some budget and you really need to put it somewhere and that's that has to be with the table of negotiation because then you sit with the industry and you sit with your counterparts in other countries and you say well where are we going to put our negotiation cards and then you need to select some sectors and some to give something or to receive something and finally, and that's the current situation, and um, because you know we are really, really close to the United States, is trade wars. Uh, because mm -hmm. in the in the way countries are becoming more protectionist, then you sit with them, and you need to negotiate something to say, okay, uh, there are some key sectors that cannot be touched, because that will harm you and that will hurt me. So I think that's exactly what the global value chains are like. Okay, there are something that. I produce fully and maybe you don't buy it, but you, do, you don't need it. But there is something I produce you need and not because you just need it to buy it. You need it to produce something you will sell. So we really need to keep this relation in global value chains. And I think uh, from a policy making perspective that at some points we could uh, further investigate with global value chains measures. Thank yeah, you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for all those points. I mean, there, there, there's a lot that's that's interesting there. Let me maybe react uh, to to a couple of things. You know, the the so the the first point that you raised that that I really like is that you know even where we've got a really important bilateral relationship, so like Mexico with the United States, um, and and of course there are analogues of that in in Asia. Um, you know pick any number of countries and their relationship with, uh, with with China stands out as particularly important. But you know, your, your point is, uh, let's not forget about all of the other relationships uh, that we have as well. We may be getting inputs from uh, a, a wide range of countries, not just uh, our largest bilateral partner. And you know, that's a crucial point about trade policy, namely that we should always do it in general equilibrium. Um, but I think when we're talking about value chains, and this is something I've been learning from my work uh, recently, I think we also need to talk about value chains in general equilibrium terms as well. So if I go back to that work I was describing, uh, looking at trade agreements and their impact on uh, value chains, you know, the pattern of trade creation and trade diversion in input markets is absolutely crucial. And it does create this kind of new way of thinking about trade creation and trade diversion. No, no longer is something that is a consumer welfare issue, but as something that is a competitiveness issue. Because if the effect of your trade agreement, and, and let, let's take USMCA as, well, or let, let, let's, let's say NAFTA. I try to avoid talking about USMCA. Um, if we take NAFTA as an example, you know, if, if, the, if an effect of the agreement is to divert Mexican producers from buying um, Chinese inputs to buying more expensive uh, but lower tariffed uh, US inputs, then that's a distortion 
and it's actually going to undermine ultimately the competitiveness of the Mexican manufacturers. So this is a really important point that you've hit on, um, that when we're talking about value chains, we really should as much as possible um, be in general, uh, general e equilibrium. Um, then your point about trade facilitation, I, I liked. I mean, I think that is one where there is some literature showing uh, that that GBC trade responds pretty strongly to uh, improvements in trade facilitation. I think we can go further in, in understanding that. Um, but I think policymakers are pretty alive to that, that uh, you know, it's, it's very intuitive in a certain sense. When you go and talk to these uh, uh, lead firms, they'll always tell you that that trade facilitation is a big deal for, for them. They're, they're not going to locate somewhere if it takes them uh, a, a week to, to, to move things across the border. So, so I think that's a, that's a very good point. And then on, uh, on trade wars, you know, something interesting uh, about trade wars is, that I'm finding, again, I'm, I'm doing research on this actively at the moment, um, even with a large shock, it, it has a big impact on trade but actually the supply chains don't unravel as much as you might expect. It, it, that genuinely surprised me uh, when I when I came across that result. And, you know, I'm still fine tuning this. I'll, I'll publish uh, the, the paper probably in, in a month or so. Um, but it seems like, uh, at least in proportional terms, you know, if you really want to upset this proportion between DBA and FBA, um, you need to engage in, in not just a trade war, but a huge trade war. Um, of course, that's what my country is uh, very unwisely uh, doing at, at the moment. Um, and there are temptations to do the same uh, in, in other places. So there is a definite risk there for uh, supply chains, but I, I think it is one um, that we can hopefully uh, keep track of over time. But all, all excellent points. So thank you uh, very much for that. So one, one question in terms of policy measures, what can governments do to build more resilient supply chains? especially in the aftermath of the disruption caused by COVID. I, I think that's a, a great, pro, great great, question. It's one that a lot of people are, are um, asking. You know, I, I, as I said, I'm a glass half full uh, kind of guy. I think that supply chains actually responded very well, uh, given the unprecedented nature of the shock. Um, but talking about greater resilience, I, I think if, if I were working for a sourcing department uh, in, in a major uh, lead firm in a value chain, I would be thinking about building in some redundancies into my network. Um, so no one wants to hold inventory anymore, which was the old way of dealing with uh, uncertainties. Um, the new way of dealing with uncertainty seems to be to build in redundancies. That That is to say that instead of buying all of my hard drives from Malaysia, I buy some of my hard drives from Malaysia and some from Korea. Okay, so I sort of diversify my supply base. Um, on an analytical level, that sort of diversification makes the supply chain uh, more resilient when, when there's a shock. It can bounce back uh, more rapidly. Um, shocks are not transmitted uh, in, in the same way as if there's only a single supplier. So I think those sorts of measures are really uh, important to look at. Uh, whether or not there needs to be a policy response you know, other than the specific case of COVID, you know, where, where, where there's a market failure, there's obviously got to be a policy response. And things like stockpiling uh, PPE, sanitizer for emergency circumstances, uh, ventilators, this is something that many countries do. Um, and I think they're probably going to be thinking about doing more of it. And, and, and you know, that, that's a perfectly reasonable uh, policy, uh, policy response. Um, but in terms of the, the value chains, uh, I'm not sure that we need a hugely heavy hand from policy. You know, I stand to be corrected uh, on that, but my, my sense is really that uh, the answer is going to come from uh, businesses repricing and reassessing risk. Um, Sornok, your, your hand is up. Would you like to unmute yourself? Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, I'd just like to add uh, to what uh, Samriddhi said. Uh, so uh, my my question would be uh, along uh, similar lines, like uh, in the wake of uh, COVID or in general, like external shocks to supply chains, uh, is there an argument to be made for localizing value chains, or would that be counterproductive to the uh, like like to reaping the benefits of trade? Well, let me give you a, let, let me give you an, an, an example to uh, to to answer that. Uh, so in in France, 
the uh, you, you, know, you, you guys probably know bread is a is a big deal in in France. It's a it's a major part of, of sort of na national culture, national cuisine, all all, all the rest. Um, so bread bread production is a is is is, is, a, is a is a is a major thing. It's something that people really care about. Um, France, for whatever reason, sources about ninety percent of its wheat locally um, for the bread supply chain. Lo and behold, when COVID hit and people were at home more and uh, also there were shocks to, to budgets and all this sorts of thing, demand for bread went up and the bread supply chain uh, hit a huge speed bump um, because they were sourcing from a single country and that country was disrupted. There were no alternative sources of supply. The general lesson that we learned from trade policy and that there's a whole literature on uh, uh, on export taxes and export prohibitions that makes this really clear. So there there was a time, particularly in in Africa, that that when there would be a bad harvest in one country, they would impose export taxes and export restrictions, and effectively export um, you know their poor harvest to everywhere else in the region. Um, at the same time, through uh, general equilibrium effects, as as keeping uh, imports out. So uh, in my view, uh, making a supply chain completely domestic is actually going to make it more subject to disruption, not less. We noticed the disruptions with COVID because they were so extreme. Um, what we don't notice is all of the other situations in which uh, the internationalization of supply chains actually smooths out uh, our uh, consumption of goods from those supply chains. And what I mean there is that if you have a diversified supplier base, a shock to one supplier doesn't ne even necessarily reach the final consumer because you you get stuff replaced from from an alternative supplier. So I don't see it. I, I don't see localizing as much of an answer. I do feel that it would be counterproductive, um, but there's a big dose of politics involved in this. So I think we all have to uh, watch that closely. Um, there's a question now about uh, SDG 12 on sustainable consumption and production. So how is the new development model of GVCs facilitating that? Um, and how do we align the ideas of the SDGs with uh, GVCs? Well, you know, I, I would say this is partly answered by the role of trade in the SDGs. There, there's no trade goal in the SDGs. Trade is, trade is only a means of implementation. So trade is good for doing a whole bunch of things. It's good for getting medicines to people. Uh, it's good for getting vaccines to people, bandages. Uh, it's good for getting uh, food to people, all, all these kinds of things. Um, is it good at regulating environmental externalities, uh, social externalities? No, it's not. It's, it's no better and no worse than any other economic mechanism. So uh, when we talk about most of what's in the SDGs, the trick, I think, from the perspective of good regulatory practice is to try and use uh, optimal regulatory strategies to get companies involved in trade to fully internalize their costs. So this is the, the theory of domestic distortions. If you've got a problem with uh, your environment, for example, so say, say that the problem is CO2 emissions, so emissions of uh, greenhouse gases, and you'd like to bring those down. Well, the way you do it is not by blocking off uh, trade. The way you do it efficiently is by uh, using a carbon tax and by using regulation effectively um, so that people who emit carbon um, pay the full social cost of uh, those, uh, those uh, emissions. So I think getting GVCs to work with the SDGs is absolutely feasible, but it requires a, a really broad based dialogue around a whole range of uh, environmental and social policies. And I think there, there are discussions that there, there are proposals in, in the literature of various institutional mechanisms uh, that we could we could use uh, to, to try and do that. Um, I, I think we're still unfortunately some way away uh, from actually achieving that. OK, so what I'm going to suggest at, at this point, we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And just take you through. Um, OK, so hopefully you can see my uh, my Excel at the moment. So what I've done, the, the Excel sheet that I gave you uh, was obviously a very big file. It's, it's the full uh, sort of three years worth of WWZ uh, decomposition from uh, ADB using the data that they put together uh, with their partners. 
So, you know, what I asked you to do in the empirical exercise was to sort of have a bit of a go at uh, playing with the data. And I, I did say that you could use your favorite software. Um, for me, I would typically use Stata uh, to do this, but I wanted to show you that it can easily be done in, uh, in something as straightforward as Excel. So what I've done here is to just take uh, an, an excerpt from the file, um, basically because I'm on my laptop and I, I don't want it to be uh, sort of wasting time scrolling slowly through uh, 100 megabytes of data. So what I've done is drawn out all of the data for uh, Argentina and China. That, that is to say the bilateral pair of uh, Argentina and China. Argentina's exports to China and China's exports to Argentina. So you can see here we, we've got exporter name, importer name, uh, we've got sector, each of the 35 sectors, and we've got uh, the three years. Then as we go across, uh, we've got the terms of the WWZ decomposition, term one, all the way through to term 16. And then at the end, we have exports, which is uh, equal subject to rounding uh, to the sum of those 16 terms. So, you know, when I look at a problem like this and, and, and I think, OK, I'm seeing these data for the first time. How do I try and learn something about them? Well, the first thing that I do is calculate DVA, FBA, PDC and DVA incorrects. And it turns out that that's very simple. You you simply, oh, I haven't got the formula in there anymore. Let me scroll down. Yeah, so you simply use a formula to sum the relevant cells. So DBA is the sum of these first cells here. Okay, and so we can simply add those up and then do correspondingly. I, I put the uh, the terms down on the uh, on the question sheet for you, and we can get uh, DBA, FBA, and PDC, and of course DBA index as well, all uh, clearly defined. So uh, once we've got the numbers. Uh, you know, I, I've done it for a single sector here. I, I decided that I would take uh, Argentina's exports of agriculture to China. Now, my reason, I, I didn't choose that sector randomly. Uh, it's not just because it's the, the first one in the list. I was interested in it because uh, often when we read policy material about global value chains in Latin America and the Caribbean, the, the point is made that, that the region doesn't participate all that much in value chains. Um, because it is specialized in the export of primary commodities, okay, well, whether it's agricultural commodities um, or, or whether it's uh, mining and, uh, and uh, that sort of output. And so what I wanted to do was to look into that and just see how it plays out in the data. So you can see I've done it in dollar terms here. Now, if I were comparing results across sectors, I would obviously compare these dollar figures uh, across sectors. But if I'm just doing the one sector, it tends to be useful to put it into percentage terms. And here I've done uh, FBA, PDC, and DVA interex. These are three indicators which uh, together give us uh, an, an idea of how much of the trade on this bilateral route is uh, associated with GBCs. Now, I, I've stacked all three of those together. The, the blue bar is FBA, the orange bar is PDC and the gray bar is DBA index. And of course, what jumps out at you is that the blue bar and the orange bar are really pretty low. We're, we're talking about basically 5% or less of the value of Argentina's uh, gross exports to China in agriculture is foreign value added or pure double counting. So if we only looked at the backward linkage perspective, we would say that there's really not much value chain activity going on uh, on this bilateral route between Argentina and China. And that I think is the conventional story uh, that, that we hear about that particular direction of trade. And that's what makes the gray bar, I think, so informative and so important. We see that when it comes to forward linkages, there's actually quite a lot of value chain trade going on. Um, that, that is to say it gets as high as 26%, um, and even at, at, at its lowest is still about 14% uh, of gross exports. So let's think for a second about what that means. That, that means that Argentina is exporting agricultural products to China, and China is then transforming those products and using them to produce its own exports. So how does that work? Well, 
you know, maybe Argentina is exporting a, a commodity, say it's soybeans, um, say it's wheat, uh, and this is going off to China. It goes into China's manufacturing sector, the food product sector, and that sector then exports uh, a processed or uh, produced or manufactured food to uh, the world market. So that's actually a classic uh, value chain uh, linkage. So again, you know, we, we shouldn't think that uh, just because we're dealing with agriculture, uh, there are no value chains. As I showed with the Nutella example in uh, class, uh, food products can absolutely have uh, value chains involved. And uh, even on this linkage, Argentina, China, there is significant uh, value chain trade that's taking place. But having said that, look at what's happening over time. The proportion of uh, uh, Argentina's agricultural exports that are being used by China as inputs into its own exports is actually falling over time. So now whether that represents uh, a, a data issue or whether it represents a secular trend is something we would really need to look into. Uh, has there been a policy change of some sort uh, that would drive this? Is there a competitiveness uh, issue for Argentinian agriculture? Um, is there a competitiveness issue for the using industries in China? So I'm not answering all of these questions. I'm simply saying that if I were doing a study of this linkage, uh, those are the sorts of areas uh, that I would go and bury into. So for the, for the second part then, I, I thought I would take a bit of a more traditional um, example. And in this case, it's exports from China to Argentina in the electronics sector. You can see again, I first calculated DBA, FBA, PDC and DBA Interex. Um, if I were doing this in a paper and I wanted to show the importance uh, sectorally, then I would calculate these dollar numbers uh, for all of the different sectors and I would look at how uh, the electronic sector compares. But what we're most interested in is the conversion to percentages, which is in uh, this little bit of the spreadsheet here and also in the graph. And you can see here that as of 2007, about 35% of China's gross exports of electronics goods to Argentina were accounted for by GBC trade. Um, and the vast majority of that was uh, backward linkages. It was foreign value added incorporated in uh, China's exports. So what does that mean concretely? Well, that means that China is exporting uh, computers and smartphones and all these sorts of things to Argentina. One would expect uh, primarily uh, consumer products. But when it does that, it's using a whole bunch of intermediate goods and services that it has bought from suppliers all around the world. Okay, if we were to delve into it, we'd find that many are in Asia, but there are also uh, are suppliers in other parts of the world, particularly once we account uh, for services con content. So we can see again that there's uh, a large proportion of GBC trade on this bilateral linkage. And um, again, it's declining over time. So if I were writing a, a paper on this, I would want to know why it's declining over time. I don't uh, know the answer to that off offhand. Is it a policy change? Um, um, is it to do with uh, with economic uh, disruption in one or, or both uh, countries? Or is it some other factor? Is it changing tastes? Is it something else? Is it enhanced competition from other providers? I, I simply don't know the answer to any of that. But if I were studying this in detail, those are the sorts of questions uh, that that I would be asking. Um, so all of that, just to give you a sense of how uh, I went uh, through uh, sort of thinking about uh, this, this issue. And I know that there were a couple of people or a few people who said that they'd had a go with uh, uh, the empirical exercise themselves. Um, we're not going to be able to share screens, but I wonder if anyone would volunteer just to tell the group very briefly uh, the countries and sectors that you looked at, the sort of analysis you did and what you found, plus maybe any problems uh, that you had. Do I have any volunteers for that? Yeah, can I, this is Anjali, can I uh, discuss my results? Certainly, please. 
Sure. Thank you. So uh, I, I worked on India and I focused on the chemical sector in particular and I tried to make a comparison of the chemical sector vis-a-vis -vis the overall economy. So I, I, I aggregated, so I had two regions, India and rest of world. And then I had two commodity sectors, chemicals and everything else, including chemicals. So broadly, what I observed over time in India was that I found that the DVA component, the, the DVA component was, was by and large increasing over time between 2007 to 2017. So this was happening for chemicals also and for all sectors also. But when I, but by comparison, the chemical, the DVA for chemical sectors was 0.83 when I'm computing in terms of as a percentage of total exports. And at an overall sectors, it was 0.85. So one could say that the domestic value addition component of the chemical sector is relatively less in comparison to the overall economy. That means probably the chemical sector where uh, in the COVID times, one tends to think in terms of pharmaceuticals uh, is where the domestic value addition component is relatively, I, I repeat, relatively less than the overall aggregate economy. 0.83 vis-a-vis 0.85. So that probably gives a hint that a lot of uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, the argument where there's a huge dependency on China for imports. Probably this is what these figures indicate. But when I look at the chemical sector in particular over time from 2007 to 2017, in that within the sector, I saw that from in the past 10 years from 2007 to 17, my domestic value addition component has increased tremendously from 0.73. It came up, it, it has gone up to 0.83. So that's a huge uh, 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 domestic uh, emphasis on domestic production of uh, of chemicals. So these are the two broad findings that I that I could uh, talk that I could figure out. But here I have a question that since I found that domestic value addition component of chemical sector, I found it to be increasing. Is it a necessary? Is it a good thing or is it a dis disadvantage? As we see in a protectionist environment especially post covid so uh, that's where that that's my query uh, from my observations yeah thanks anjali that 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 sounds great i mean it, it sounds like you've gone about the exercise in in just uh, the, the the way that i i was hoping i mean i i, I will say that you know the the percentage figures that you're reporting for DBA are pretty high and, and as i said this is all in comparative terms that there's no kind of absolute sense of what, what's high and what's low. Um, but based on figures that I've seen for other countries, that's that that's pretty high. So, you know, I think it does fit with this story of Indian industry and, and I think particularly heavy industry like chemicals um, being focused on the domestic market. The change over time is really interesting. I I, I don't know what, what's produced that. Of, of course, India has been having all sorts of changes in trade policy uh, over the last years. Um, I'm not specifically aware of anything uh, in chemicals um, and, and affecting inputs. I don't know if there have been any changes uh, to things like duty drawback and, and uh, some of these other schemes that give uh, preferential access to inputs. But uh, again, if, if I were writing something on the Indian chemical sector, I would be digging into these kind of issues to try and see uh, what's what's going on. Um, so because the, the change over time is a pretty significant one uh, ha happening in in a period of, of, of basically 10 years um so yeah i i think you've you've gone uh, you, you've gone about that very uh, very very nicely thank you thank you for sharing that uh Preeti, i see your hand up as well hi ben. so um uh, uh, i wanted to share my case study um, i also worked on uh, india uh, but what I found in my results when I uh, did uh, study the data on an MVP level, uh, like India with all of the partner countries, which is the world. So uh, what I found was uh, the BBA intermediate export 
actually declined from about 21% to 18% over the period 2007 to 2017. So, uh, and even for uh, the foreign land as added um, as a share of the exports, they also decreased uh, from 2007 to 2017. But for the, for the year 2011, it actually increased. So, um, and I worked uh, for my uh, sectoral analysis. I worked with agriculture sector because India has a uh, policy interest in this sector and is kind of protecting it. So the figures which I obtained for my uh, foreign value added in agriculture sector were really very marginal. Like it's point point zero seven percent and it just it also declined with uh, uh, to point zero six percent in 2017 but on the other hand the BBA intermediate practical sector increased over years from 2007 to 2017, although this was also a marginal increase from 0.45% in 2007 to 0.7% in 2011. So uh, this is what I found out, but I was not actually able to uh, link it with the policy thing here. So I also posted a question in the chat box uh, asking that when we get these results, do we have to link it to the big policy or the domestic politics going on in the country? So how do we actually go about it? Thank you. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's the million dollar question. So I, I think, I mean, thanks very much for describing uh, all, all of that. Again, I, I think you, you've thought about uh, the issue in exactly the right way. Um, the, but but the, the policy question is really crucial. Now, in the empirical exercise, I, I didn't ask you to, to go off and do, you know, six weeks worth of policy research to try and get to the bottom of this. Um, often the answer is very hard to find. Um, you know, sometimes it can be a, a really technical uh, kind of change that, that makes a, a, a big difference. Um, but certainly the, the, the dynamics that you're reporting uh, from, from India in both cases I think would be worthy of going through, uh, you know, policy changes over that period to see what what might be uh, causing that. Um, it may be a direct policy. It may be an indirect policy that's acting through some complicated uh, general equilibrium effects. Um, so yeah, and and actually we've just seen in chat the the same thing for transport equipment. We we see DVA going up over time. So, uh, you know, it, it's no surprise that Indian governments historically have, have basically wanted DBA to be as close to 100% as possible. Um, post-1991, obviously that, uh, that, that changed, but it never changed as radically as it did in other places. And so I think, uh, I, I think what, what we're seeing now is a, is a complex, uh, complex interplay of different policy and political uh, forces. So if I were studying this, I would be going into, uh, you know, what are the policy changes at a really micro level that might be affecting uh, the, the, these results. And by the way, a, a good way of figuring out what those are is to go and talk to businesses, you, you know, either business associations or actual businesses. And, and, you know, talk to them, ask them why they're not sourcing stuff overseas. Um, you know, are they happy with the stuff that they're sourcing from India? Um, or is, is there some reason why they do it anyway? So I, I think by doing this combination of kind of quantitative and qualitative work, you can start to tease out a potentially really interesting uh, story. So An Anjali was just asking for the floor back. So maybe I can hand over to her for a second. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so uh, when I worked out my figures, I was also not very comfortable with such high proportions of DBA. I mean, it was abnormally high compared to what I've seen in other reports, development indicators or something of similar types. So one reason after after your having pointed it out, I could quickly go back to my Excel spreadsheet and I could 
so possibly i i picked up the figures wrong i just want to check with you so what i am supposed to be doing is i am supposed to consider india's bilateral trade with with with, with all with all countries and then all other remaining countries should their their respective bilateral trade should should constitute the rest of the world is is that how i was supposed to group so okay. for in, for instance there is there's india and there are two countries so india one and two three countries so i'm supposed to consider india's trade with country one and two add them up so that makes my india's exports mm -hmm. and then the total of countries one and two with india or or with with, with the rest of the world should be one of uh, well, those are those are two different directions. So if you're interested in India's exports, then you simply choose whether you want to look at one bilateral direction. You you can look at uh, in India's exports to the United States, and and that's an interesting policy question, and and you can look into it. If you want to look at India's exports with the world, then you take all of the all of the uh, uh, rows in uh, the Excel sheet that have India as the exporter, and you add them up. Um, which I, I, I think is what you've done. So, so yeah, that, that sounds right to me. Um, oh. Adding it up in the other direction, so taking the rest of the world and its exports to India, that's probably a bit less informative because the breakdown is of value added in exports. And I'm not sure, you know, given how heterogeneous the rest of the world is, I'm not sure how much we're going to learn by uh, aggregating it. But, but, you know, from a math standpoint adding it up that way is uh, is is fine um let me hand now just quickly to uh sornok uh, who's been hand up for a while uh, thanks professor uh, i just want to discuss uh whether the methodology i employed in my exercise is correct or not so uh what i did was i wanted to find out uh, the shares of certain countries uh for the machinery sector the shares of certain countries how much uh, value they're contributing uh, to India. Like, uh, so basically what I tried to do was uh, out of the um, aggregate value added to India in its uh, machinery exports, how much value has been added by certain countries. So basically the method that I used was, uh, uh, the, uh, was basically the origin countries uh, domestic value added to India by the whole universe of value added to India in its machinery exports. Is this method correct or should the it it depends on what you want to say? Uh, be, be, uh, my like uh, my dilemma was whether to replace uh, value added by imports, for instance, origin countries, domestic value added to India by total imports to India. Would that be the correct indicator or should the denominator be the world value added to India? Sorry, I'm 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 not sure I'm I'm following. I mean, if you if if you want to get total value, so you know, in in the example I, I showed, I also calculated uh, China's uh, total uh, domestic value added in exports of electrical goods to Argentina. That that's just DVA, and you can divide that by gross exports um, because DVA plus FVA plus PDC sums to gross exports. It's just a question of what that tells you. So it doesn't, uh, I mean, you know, it, it, it tells you uh, what part of uh, that, uh, that kind of, what, what, what part of the exporting country's gross exports actually originates in value added transactions in that country. And that, that's all it tells you. So if that's something you're interested in, by all means report it. From a GBC point of view, we're normally interested in actually all the rest. It's FBA and PDC uh, that's going to interest us the most. Uh, Professor, in your, just if I take your example, like uh, how much value uh, China is adding in its exports to Argentina, my question would be uh, out of the universe of value added to say Argentina's exports, Argentina's uh, out of the universe of foreign value added in Argentina's exports of say uh, mining, how much value is specifically originating from China? So in that, so uh, basically, that's, uh, that's the different questions. <laughs> So actually the WWZ decomposition is not great at answering that because it's a different accounting perspective. So okay. uh, so if you, so actually uh, a way that you can get an answer to that, and it's an imperfect one, 
is to use uh, the technique that I walked you through in, uh, in, in lecture two. So the original kind of old style, old school uh, Leontief de decomposition, and that that will give you value added by origin uh, country sector. So it, it's, it, you know, this is with all caveats, it, it can be inconsistent, it can be badly behaved, all, all the rest, but it will get you an answer to, uh, to that sort of question. But, but the WWZ decomposition is taking a different uh, accounting perspective. Uh, Anjali, I see your hand up, and then I, I think we're going to have to uh, draw a line after that, sure. I'm afraid. Sure. So, uh, while you were discussing your results on Argentina and China, so you were explaining, so the, the gray bar is showing the export component, the, 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 the Argentina's value addition in exports, which are used in China's exports. That's, that's right. what came out. So, is it possible to talk in terms of Argentina's value added in exports used in the Chinese economy. I don't specifically want to talk of how much of this it is embedded into China's exports particularly, but all that is being used in the Chinese economy is is can 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 we figure out this in the given framework? So I don't want to talk I about mean. Chinese exports. I want to talk about Chinese production system is using how much of Argentina's value addition. Uh, so you, you would need to do some algebra to work that out. So that that's not coming out of the decomposition that we've looked at. It, we're using similar techniques. I suspect uh, that you can get to that result, um, but it's not one that I've seen published, um, probably because I'm hanging around the trade literature too much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so look, everyone, thank you so much uh, for your active, uh, indeed very active uh, participation. I really appreciate all of the questions, all of the comments, uh, all of the discussion points and all of the uh, in input. And uh, uh, I am going to have to uh, hand back uh, the microphone at this point to Watata because there, there is more on the program and I've, I've gone a few minutes uh, over already. So uh, thanks very much for bearing with me. You've, you've been a great uh, audience and I, I really do appreciate uh, all of the interest that you've shown in the material. So uh, Watata, back to you. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, it's excellent discussion sessions you made. Uh, I still saw a few more questions coming, so I, I hope you don't mind if I wrote to you in the email on, on sure. those questions. Uh, before you leave, uh, I would like to request everyone to turn on camera and we will have a, a screenshot capture with Ben to share with you all later. Pippi, Nicholas, Pam, Samantha, do you want to turn on your camera? Okay, uh, to to make them to make it finish early because it's very late now in New York time. Uh, Natapon, can you please do the the screenshot, please? One, two, three. Okay, I think we got it. Uh, thank you very much all. Thank you very much, Ben. You must be very tired. <laughs> uh, you are mute. Okay, uh, I will I will have follow up questions with you in the emails and I will share your response uh, to the rest of the group. Thank you, Ben. Bye. Hi, all. Uh, I will invite uh, my colleagues, Richard, to present the the preliminary versions of the interactive database on GVC analysis. Uh, I saw many questions during Ben's sessions that 
uh, asking about uh, interpretations of those indicators, how to get the indicators calculated for particular countries and how how that would mean for for the policy makers. So with the upcoming interactive database developed based on ADB MRIO data, SCAP has done uh, aggregations and based on the 16 WWC decompositions and then do analysis at focusing at bilateral relationships to enhance the pictures and the understanding of how GVC link between two pairs of the countries. When we finish the final version, the database will be put up online and it will have both visualizations for you with uh, your selections of the country. Plus, we will offer the, the download of the indicators that back up the database. This database is the is one of the products that we have been support by FILAC forums, which are uh, with building the knowledge products to understand value chain linkages between East Asian countries and Latin America country. We make it more comprehensive by covering more than just East Asian country and Latin America to cover as much as possible with the uh, uh, that the ADB MIO, which is the underlying data, can can uh, cover in terms of country scopes. So you will see in a moment of how this database can fit into your policy analysis, but you may have to wait. Uh, a little bit to to be able to access the database and download the data because now we are still in the process of uh, reviewing the database and making the visualization as nice as possible and uh, fit the purpose of helping policy makers and apply policy researchers to understand uh, value chains linkages across the regions as much as possible. So uh, once you see this database and you have any idea or feedback to suggest chance, please feel free to send me the feedback. We would take it into account and try to see how much we can do to improve upon on those interface. So now I'm uh, may I request Richard to present to you the uh, beta versions of SCAP RIVA, we call it RIVA uh, platform coming from regional integration and value chain analysis. Please, Richard, you may take the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Ritada, for that introduction to our e platform. Uh, so I'm currently sharing my screen. Hopefully, in a few moments, all of you will be able to see it. Yes, so as uh, Dr. Vitada mentioned, uh, the SCAP FELAC e-platform Riva covers two topics, uh, regional integration as well as global value chains. Uh, currently, the regional integration section is still under development, so we'll be focusing today's presentation and demonstration on the GVC section. So let's begin with that. So as, uh, as we mentioned earlier, essentially we'd like to use the ADB MRIO database to its fullest capacity to essentially provide all the possible indicators that would support policy research based on uh, input output data. So in that regard, we look at five particular areas that we consider most relevant for policy makers and policy analysts evaluating global value chains. Those include establishing what are the key GVC relationships for uh, economies in Asia, Latin America, as well as globally, what, what is considered in their structure of value added or uh, terms that were, that, that, that were covered in Ben's earlier presentation 
on uh, imported content in the form of foreign value added or uh, domestic value added and so on and so forth. In addition, we will be covering what is accounted for in GDC participation between particular bilateral pairs of economies, essentially covering domestic or value added used for further export production, that is forward linkages, backward linkages, as well as double counted exports. In addition to giving a very detailed explanation on backward linkages, uh, essentially uh, determining origin of value added starts and where it ends, as well as in forward linkages talking about the DVA intrex terms covered by Ben in the earlier section. So let's begin with the first one covering key GVC relationships. So over here we can select our economy of interest. As an example, I will choose the Republic of Korea and I will choose 2017. For the, for the moment, the MRIO tables that we have from ADB cover only three years, but the database will be updated as and when new data becomes available. So as an example, let me choose 2017. And we look at three particular sections. So to begin with, we look at an overview of uh, Korea's GVC participation, both from a backward perspective in terms of imported content as well as in terms of a forward perspective, looking at DVA intrex or rather the export of intermediates by Korea used in further export production in other economies. So essentially this visualization helps you establish what is the value of this or backward or forward participation and how much does it count for as a share of Korea's gross exports. We can then move on to establishing Korea's key GVC relationships, first by looking at the key exporting sectors uh, for Korea's economy that depend strongly on GVC linkages. We have chosen the top five economies, both from a forward and a backward perspective, to establish key relationships. So as an example, all of, this, all of these details can be drilled down to look at further information. So as an example, we look at uh, the electrical and optical equipment sector in Korea having $45 billion of foreign value added coming into its exports to the world, accounting for 21% of its gross exports. What we can do over here is drill down into this data to look at it in a, a little more detail to see where this is originating from. So when we click on that, we essentially get to see what share of this foreign value added is coming from the top five uh, key importing or rather source economies. So we look at China being the, the key contributor, followed by Japan, the United States, Taiwan, and Germany. All, all the other sections can also be drilled down, whether from a forward perspective or a backward perspective. For example, looking in terms of forward linkages for the chemical sector, we can see that Korea's key linkages um, from a forward perspective are with China, Taiwan province of China, Vietnam, Japan and the United States, particularly for Korea's chemical sector. So thus far, we've covered Korea's key GVC relationships from a sector perspective. We can also move on to examining this by Korea's key partners in GVC linkages. So over here, over here we can see China, Japan, the United States, Australia and Germany being some of the key GVC participants for Korea's exports from a backward perspective. If we'd like to see how much or what sectors in particular are linked uh, by these economies, we can just drill down by clicking on this, seeing that for the case of Japan, the largest contribution is in electrical and optical equipment, followed by transport equipment and chemicals. And similarly, we can look at Korea's forward linkages with a particular partner. Given that our workshop, of course, focuses on East Asian and Latin American linkages, we can focus on Mexico which is one of Korea's key forward linkage uh, partners. And we can see that Korea's contributions uh, to Mexico come especially from the electrical optical equipment sector, metals and transport equipment. While these are very useful pieces of information, they essentially provide only an overview of uh, uh, GVC linkages uh, between economies. So as we proceed with this demonstration, I'll be drilling deeper in to understand exactly what these relationships look like. So let's move on to the next section on structure of value added. So over here again, or uh, you can choose any economy of interest. Let's for the moment stick with the Republic of Korea and stick with 2017 as our year of interest. And let me choose Mexico as our importing economy of interest since we've seen that Mexico is a key 
or a key partner of the Republic of Korea in GVC linkages. And for the moment, of course, let's choose all sectors, but you have uh, users will have the ability to choose any sector of their preference, depending on their research interests. So essentially here we cover how we disaggregate Korea's exports, which, which essentially covers five terms uh, based on the WWZ decomposition. So these five terms are essentially an aggregation of the 16 terms used in the, in the WWZ uh, decomposition, covering what part of Korea's exports are used in the Im importer's consumption, covering the DVA int and DVA fin terms, as well as those used in domestic consumption, which is RDV used in the importer's export production, essentially the DVA intrex terms, as well as FVA through imported content and double counted terms. So looking at this, we can get a quick picture of the structure of Korea's exports to Mexico. And we can see right at the outset, a major section of it is essentially coming from GDC related exports covered by these three terms used in export production, double counted terms, as well as imported content, which is foreign value added. We can also go on to see the difference in the trade balance between Republic of Korea and Mexico based on two perspectives, looking at it from a gross perspective or rather looking at it from a domestic value added perspective. And what's interesting over here is to be able to like disaggregate how different these two perspectives are owing to foreign value added in these in these linkages. Furthermore, we go on to compare uh, the, the same linkage uh, essentially in terms of exports to Mexico, but for other East and Northeast Asian economies. Over here, since I selected the Republic of Korea, the other economies that appear in this graph are Korea's regional partners or rather sub-regional partners in the East and Northeast uh, sub-region of Asia Pacific. If I were, for example, to choose Vietnam exports to Mexico, all the economies that would feature over here would be other Southeast Asian economies. And this helps provide an initial uh, outlook on the structure of value added for a particular region or rather the countries in that region to a, uh, to a specific importer, in our case, Mexico. So let's move on to the next section where we'll talk about participation in GVCs. So this section is spe uh, specifically talks about three terms covered in the previous section, which is essentially the DVA intrex terms talking about forward participation the FVA terms talking about um, imported content, as well as the double counted terms, which as, as seen from the WWZ decomposition, uh, highlight uh, deepening inter-country uh, inter cross-border production linkages. So as an example over here, let's mix up the economies a little bit. Let's choose Chile, for example, and let's look at Chile's exports to Japan, since we're looking at East Asian and Latin American GVC linkages. So we select Japan as our economy of interest for from an importing perspective, and I'm going to keep the year st uh, st uh, static for 2017. Of course, that can be changed if required, and I'm going to maintain all exporting sectors, which of course can also be adjusted depending on, um, on your research interests. Actually here, this graph took uh, a load. As you can see, it was running uh, a lot of calculations because what we'd like to show over here is not just Chile's exports or rather Chile's GDC participation with Japan, but additionally, we'd also like to see all other Latin America, uh, Latin American and Caribbean economies participation, GDC participation with Japan. So for Chile, we see obviously over here that 27.6% of it is forward linkages, essentially meaning that 27% of Chile's exports to Japan are used in Japan's further export production. In addition, we also highlight what this amounts to, which over here is $2.9 billion. And we can again look at Chile's imported content in exports to Japan, which is 9.73%, as well as Chile's double counted exports or from repeated border crossings in exports to Japan. This can be compared to other economies in the region, for example, with Colombia to look at both uh, GVC participation 
from a percentage share in exports to the partner as well as in terms of absolute values where in this case we can obviously see that for the case of Colombia's exports to Japan while the share in in GVC exports is of course uh, relatively smaller it is significantly smaller when we're looking at the absolute value which in this case is only 74 million so these these graphs essentially would adjust dynamically based on your choice of exporting economy again as I mentioned earlier if I were to choose uh, Japan for example all the economies that would feature over here would be other economies uh, in East and Northeast Asia or if I were to choose um, India it would it would feature all the economies in South and Southwest Asia essentially to give users a quick look not just at, at their economy of interest exports or GVC exports to a particular importer but also how that compares across other economies in that particular sub region. So now with now that we have a, a pretty good overview of the, the general structure of GVC participation, we can drill down into backward linkages more specifically. So over here, let's choose Colombia as our economy of interest. And let's see what Colombia's exports to the United States look like in terms of backward linkages owing to the fact that the United States, of course, is Colombia's most important export destination. So again, I'm, as always, I'm keeping the year and the exporting sector fixed, but these can be adjusted as, as they can be across all these sections on our e-platform. And over here, we can look at where Colombia's exports, or rather where Colombia's foreign value added in exports to the United States originates from. Over here, this little uh, this little infographic hopefully provides a little more uh, clarity on this slightly complicated topic because it's essentially covering a three country production linkage. So we have our source economies, which are all the economies covered in this tree map, and we have our exporting economy of interest, which is Colombia. We have our exporting sector, which we've chosen as all, and we have our importing economy, which is the United States. So over here, we can essentially understand that in Colombia's exports to the United States, a major part or rather 23% of foreign value added in that particular GVC comes from the United States itself, while another significant portion of it comes from, from the European, from, uh, from Europe, uh, shown by all the red economies over here, and from the Asia Pacific region, with a pretty substantial section coming from China, amounting to 8.6% of uh, Colombia's foreign value added to the United States. We can also see in this particular GVC linkage how different it is across other Latin American countries. So over here we have Colombia, which of course we can see in terms of gross exports to the, to the United States has relatively low foreign value added as compared to, for example, Mexico. And over here, what, what's also really informative and useful about these graphs is you can drill down into them to see things in more detail, of course, while also being able to very quickly understand which are the important regions where foreign value added is originating. You can also drill down to see within a particular region which economies are contributing the most towards um, towards foreign value added in this particular uh, GVC. So in this particular case, in terms of interpreting the graph, what this means is in Mexico's exports to the United States, 5.1% of that is coming, 5%, 5.1% of those gross exports is foreign value added originating in China. Or for the case of Korea, 1.7% of Mexico's gross exports to the, to the United States originate in the Republic of Korea. So that covers backward linkages, considering exporting sectors, as you would see over here, or selecting by an exporting sector. We can also select this by source economies. If we have a particular three country production network, we'd like to examine in more detail. So let's go ahead and continue with our example of Colombia and the United States. As seen in the previous graph, we saw that from an Asia Pacific perspective, China was a pretty important contributor towards Colombia's exports to the United States. So let's go ahead and select China as our source economy of interest. And let's see what this GVC structure looks like from a sector perspective. So over here, essentially what this tree map shows us is in Colombia's exports to the United States originating from China, which exporting Colombia are the most dependent on this foreign value added. So of course we can see here that mining and quarrying owing to of course uh, primary sectors being very important in Latin American exports 
is a pretty is the most important section accounting for 35 percent of this foreign value added followed by high-tech manufacturing most specifically or uh, in the form of basic and fab fabricated metals as well as again in a, another uh, uh, primary sector which is agriculture and to a lesser extent in textiles so essentially all of these sectors are broken down also by particular levels of aggregation so over here we group these particular sectors of the 35 mrio sectors included in the database we group them based on um, erdl classification so over here we look at whether they are high tech manufacturing or low tech manufacturing or, or service sectors and so on and so forth and similarly as in the previous section we can also see particularly for all other latin american economies exports to the united states we can look at the particular export structure from um, from a sector perspective and we can see how that varies across uh, economies in the region where we see of course for mexico owing to um, owing to its major participation in uh, transport and electrical equipment um, gvcs we see a major section coming from a uh, high tech manufacturing and of course as i mentioned we can drill down and see particularly how much these sectors contribute or how much these sectors are dependent on a uh, foreign value added from a particular source in this particular case of course it's china over here it's also useful for us to or switch it up and and look at a different uh, GVC. So right now we looked at Colombia's exports to, to the United States. We can also mix this up a little bit to see how this varies compared to another another economy. Let's take Vietnam and see how much this varies. to understand where Vietnam's uh, source of foreign value added originates from compared to where Colombia's uh, source of foreign value added orig originates from. So over here, of course, similar to what I'd shown you earlier, we can see the different regions where uh, foreign value added in Vietnam's exports to the United States comes from. Of course, for Vietnam, as would be expected, a much larger portion is coming from uh, the Asia Pacific region itself and to a much lesser extent, the EU and Latin America. And again, we see China being the key contributor over here, followed by Republic of Korea and Japan in Vietnam's exports uh, to the United States. And we can also look at this as before to see which particular sectors in Vietnam depend the most on this foreign value added coming from China. So we stick to our same GVC linkage, except uh, of course, replacing our exporting economy with Vietnam instead of um, Colombia. And over here, we can see a much different production structure or much different GVC sectoral dependence, where for Vietnam, the major portion of its exporting sector dependence on China comes from low tech manufacturing, most notably, of course, in textiles, leather and uh, food products, and to a lesser extent in high tech manufacturing like electrical and optical equipment. So this is just to give you an indication of how you can very quickly surmise differences in value chain linkages between economies and between regions, even looking drilling down, of course, into sectors. And as before, I, I don't think I need to cover this again. You can drill down uh, into particular sectors across the sub region. So in this case, of course, since I've chosen Vietnam, you have all the other Southeast Asian economies over here, which you can compare. So with that covered, we can move on to examining forward linkages, which essentially covers um, DVA intrex terms. So over here, let's again switch our options to uh, examine different linkages. So let's select Brazil as our example or as our country of interest. And again, as before, I'm maintaining the year and exporting course these can be adjusted. For the moment, I have no particular interest in examining a particular sector, which is why I'm sticking to all. And of course, I'd rather stick to the most recent year. So I'm maintaining 2017. As before, this uh, the initial part of this page gives a quick idea of what we'll be looking at in the in the in the latter part of the section. So over here we have our exporting economy of interest, which is Brazil. Uh, we've chosen our exporting sector, which is all sectors, and we've Oh, and over here, it selects it across all importing economies and keeping third economies fixed as the world. So essentially what we see here is how much Brazil contributes towards export production in other economies. 
or in terms of quick terms to pull out from this graph, we can see that $53 billion worth of Brazil's or gross or, or worth of Brazil's exports are essentially used in further export production. So this is essentially the DDA intrex in Brazil's exports to the world, again, compared to Brazil's gross exports to the world. And we can see that the Asia Pacific region is a pretty big recipient of this DVA intrex from Brazil, followed by the European Union and to a lesser extent, Latin America and North America. As before, we can see how this compares across other Latin American economies. So we can see, for example, in the case here, Peru as well has a fairly high share of uh, its gross exports to the world uh, being used in further export production, again, with a pretty major part of that going into the Asia Pacific region, again, highlighting the uh, certain particular important GDC linkages between East Asia and Latin America. And as before, we can always drill down to see which particular economies are most important in these GDC linkages between East Asia and, and Latin America. And unsurprisingly, of course, it's the big economies with China, Japan and Republic of Korea accounting for the major share. So far, we we looked at for, we looked at forward linkages from an exporting sector perspective. We can also look at this from an importing economy if we'd like to see some particular linkage in particular. So over here, let me choose um, the importing economy as China, since uh, right before this, we established that the Asia Pacific region is a pretty big recipient of Brazil's DDA intrex, with China being key among them. So let's go ahead and select China to see which sectors in particular is Brazil contributing a lot towards, or rather which sectors in Brazil are contributing a lot towards uh, export production in China. So this graph essentially gives us that perspective, showing us again and highlighting um, the, the focus of most Latin American economies on primary products. So of course on agriculture sector, as well as on mining and quarrying, and to a lesser extent on uh, low tech manufacturing, such as paper, leather and food products as well as uh, 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 high-tech manufacturing such as metals and chemicals. And again, as in all these graphs, we can we can compare this, this particular GVC linkage and this particular GVC dependence across other Latin American countries. And this really helps highlight key factors about, uh, about these GVC linkages with, of course, a, a very quick look highlighting that almost all economies in Latin America depend most strongly on their mining exports to China uh, in terms of their GVC participation, in terms of GVC, in, in terms of forward linkages. As an example, we can, we can switch an economy to see how much this particular sectoral dependence changes depending on the economies being considered. So right now we selected, let's go ahead and select a South to see how much this differs. So, as an example, I'm going to choose Thailand and have a look as to how this export structure from um, or, or rather how this forward value chain participation looks from an export sector perspective. So at the outset, we see for Thailand uh, in particular, it's a very, very different um, outlook with high tech manufacturing accounting for a much larger share of Thailand's forward forward value chain participation, followed by low tech manufacturing and to a lesser extent or at the agriculture sector. And we can also compare this across uh, Southeast Asian economies where over here, very clearly mining accounts for a much, uh, accounts for an important share in the much, in much fewer economies as compared to the case of Latin America. While looking at high-tech manufacturing, we see very clearly that um, this particular broad sector is much more important for Southeast Asian economies value chain integration with China. And as in all the graphs I've shown you before, we can drill down particularly to see where this is, which particular sectors this is most important in. And unsurprisingly, it's electrical and optical equipment, which of course the Southeast Asian and East and Northeast Asian regions are well known for. And in this case for, in this case for, uh, for Thailand in particular, we also see chemical and chemical products being, being an important aspect. And that brings us to the end of this demonstration on our GVCE platform. But at this point, what I can show you in terms of linkages between this platform and existing platforms that SCAP has developed before this is in terms of linking this Riva platform, this regional integration value chain analyzer,
to a pre-existing product we have, which is Tina, which is our trade investment and negotiation advisor. So just to see how seamless the integration between these platforms is, we have our exporting economy selected as Thailand, our importing economy selected as China. All we need to do is go ahead and select the Tina link over here that directs us to the Tina website with these two economies pre-selected. So if you are done examining GVC linkages between the economies of between your economies of interest, you can also go ahead deeply into other trade matters or between these bilateral pairs. Of course, in this case, Thailand and China, we can examine current trade at also a product level, in addition to trade facilitation measures being implemented by both these economies, trade agreements that both these economies have entered into, as well as non-tariff measures that they are imposing on each other. In addition, Tina also has uh, an added feature of supporting negotiations on particular products uh, and, it, uh, and additionally also uh, running um, smart tariff simulations based on partial equilibrium models. So this essentially just highlights a quick link between these two websites to give users a more full experience in terms of understanding trade and value chain linkages between. Yes, so thank you very much for your for for taking the time to listen to this and yeah, we we welcome your feedback and uh, comments on our on our platform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard, for the presentation. Now I open the floor for uh, questions about Riva. Um, I, I leave my answers to some of the comments that uh, I saw in the chat box. Uh, overall, I, I would like to say that uh, this version is still preliminary and uh, we will put it for, for public access about uh, late of this year. The, um, the link between this Riva and Tina is, is the supplement, is to supplement database that SCAP has provided. Uh, some of you may be already uh, see Tina and uh, use it for, for for your analysis already. Tina is the live initiative, so we update the data, I think, uh, regularly, at least once a year. Jan may confirm. Uh, for Riva, which is now a sister of Tina, it will give a more complete picture for, for trade analyzers, because now when you are looking at uh, negotiations with, with selected countries. You not only see the gross trade relationships and uh, tariff relationships, but now you can dig deeper into how these selected partners is linked with you through backward or forward integrations of the value chains. And we will improve and update this river whenever we have the, the data, the, the, the ADB, which is our big data sponsors uh, has updated the MRIO. However, uh, because MRIO is based on input output tables, so keep it in mind that it's not the high frequency statistic mm -hmm. as the, the, the normal trade statistics. And it is based on very much uh, estimations and assumptions as uh, you have already seen in Ben's presentation. Uh, I, I hope that you will find this platform useful when we put it live up there in, in the internet. Uh, I don't see questions from the floor. Oh, excuse me, Convitida. Sorry, just to jump in because I, I saw somebody mention about data availability. Uh, this is also some. This is something I should I should have covered. Um, I can also uh, give you all a quick a quick look at that in terms of um, data querying on the particular indicators on this website. So essentially, um, this covers this is covered in the data download section, which is on the first page where you are able to. Of course, this is all under development, but you are able to select your indicator of choice, which essentially links to all of the data 
shown in the web platform um, and of course allowing you to select uh, all the economies importing exporting source economies sectors and years of interest and allowing you to download all of this uh, in csv format so just to clarify that Thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm going. I'm going back to the chat box now, and I see few questions. I uh, the data availability and the technical notes on how we calculate these indicators will be available on on the platform. We have that that metadata and technical notes page. Um, yeah. Thank you for the tough questions on how to use it in GVC reconfigurations. Uh, yes, this river is giving you trade in value added data is, is the pictures of, of your GVC linkages up to the date of the data, which is now is 2017. Right, Richard? So yes, that's that's correct. It doesn't show the new shape of GVC if it is going to happen, let's say post COVID, because it's not reflect in input output data yet. However, we can make use the information of uh, trade in value added linkages, which we have we currently have in the country to uh, uh, to make an implications on what would happen if you, let's say you not sourcing from china so you will see and have the ideas of how big in your cost functions that will change because you know exactly how much you source from China to produce garments or textile products, let's say. So if you rely 80% of import inputs from China, now you are saying you're not going to import from them. You are going to source it domestically. So this 80% of the cost would be affected. Further analysis is needed if you want to see how much it would affect your cost. For example, you have to come up with the surveys or the estimations of how different is the cost that your domestic producers and Chinese import and import from, from China different. And then your calculation on how how cost of your textile product will change will, will come along. Cost comparisons will also apply when you're looking at uh, the, the source of your inputs. Uh, if you know that your main source of, of textile inputs come from China, uh, from India, from Vietnam at different proportions. So this will bridge your, will make, will building your understanding on what would be alternative of suppliers that you you may you may shift if if you diversifying your uh, input source and also you can understand the forward linkages from the perspective of what you produce here are used in in other country export so anything that happens from your uh, downward uh, market, for example, if you are supplying to China and China use your uh, export as input for the uh, export to US market, anything happens uh, to China from, from the US actions would affect you through these forward linkages. So this is more of uh, building your conceptual understanding and drawing implications based on a better understanding of your country positions along the value chains.
Yan confirm that uh, Tina update at least annually. Thanks, Yan. Uh, when will be available to ASNET members by the end of this year? And uh, it will be also extend to the other. As you can see in Richard's first presentation slide, that is two part in this platform. One is GVC, the other part is regional integration. So next year, we will add the portion of regional integration which looking into indicators of regional integration uh, from trade to uh, GVC, to finance, to infrastructures, to digital based on uh, our digital, digital uh, and regional and sustainable regional integration database. Um, do I miss any questions? OK, I think I cover all the questions. Uh, Richard? Please confirm that I don't miss any questions. Yes, you, you've covered all the questions. Yeah, just I think an additional thing from Jacqueline was essentially a useful comment for us to have uh, some type of checklist highlighting what countries we have uh, information for, you know, so users don't have to drill down into the download section to see what countries are covered. So would be a useful addition which we can which we can add in um, at some uh, some initial section of the website. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea and we will take it forward to clean. Thank you very much. Uh, then I think we come to the last part of the workshop. Uh, I I will invite Mia to 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 say something to all of you and uh, also thank you our partner on behalf of the team running this PLAC project. Please Mia. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I, I hope um, the people uh, online will not uh, get an impression that I get uh, to speak only to thank people um, uh, before and after the event. Uh, <laughs> I enjoyed very much the presentations and the discussions that were um, held this, this morning and uh, in particular that the work of ESCAP has been received with uh, great enthusiasm by the participants and our partners. Uh, and I think while we have some work to do still on, on this, it will turn to be a very useful tool. As uh, Vitada uh, uh, prompted uh, to, to explain how it can be actually used to uh, improve the understanding of, of policymakers in this uh, in this area and uh, and particularly the costing of uh, or the cost uh, implications of uh, sort of um, their um, uh, probing into into the or 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 or, or um, uh, uh, nudging into the into the uh, the the framework or the architecture of the of the GVCs. So I think the tools like this. Are very useful uh, to uh, in a in a rather simplistic way, but uh, but still in the right direction to show um, these implications and and hopefully then keep the policymakers also on track in terms of uh, the, uh, the 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 in, inter uh, uh, meddling into into the into the, uh, the the decisions that perhaps are not necessarily always uh, leading to the overall improvement in, uh, in, in, in welfare. Well, anyway, uh, let me not uh, go into, into that area. I really want to thank uh, our resource persons uh, uh, and, uh, you know, in particular Ben, but also everyone else who, who spoke and, uh, and contributed uh, to, to the successful uh, of of this project, we have come a long way. I think um, since we started this project, uh, and uh, uh, I I can see Vitada uh, uh, scratching her head in the beginning and saying, "What are we gonna do with this? This is uh, this is uh, really uh, complicated." 
But from that time, uh, Vitada and uh, our colleagues in, in ECLAC and our colleagues in, in ADB uh, with uh, help from, from Artnet community and Artnet advisors have actually come a long way to, to this uh, now step. And so we will continue work in understanding um, what drives global value chains and how we can actually use both uh, the uh, the analytical tools, uh, data, uh, and in, uh, of course interaction with both policymakers and business in uh, making the best uh, of um, of decision making and policy tools in in this area. So I think the next um, uh, territory that we would like to go into is really to dip, dig deeper into the. Um, into what uh, is being called under the project uh, hidden complementarities uh, in um, in the context of value chains and this is role of um, business to business uh, services uh, in particular digitally uh, enabled services and so we will be working towards that uh, i think we are not the only one working on that there are from what i have seen from other agencies world bank uh, and the others are uh, increasingly engaging resources in that, so we might be getting also new partners um, to uh, to um, uh, sort of speed up and and enhance our work in that. Uh, because while the while the need to to produce in this area uh, is large, uh, the funding, as as you may be aware, is uh, particularly in the COVID situation, uh, is uh, might be getting tighter. So. Um, from that perspective, we will really appreciate your active engagement and contributions uh, whenever it is uh, appropriate and uh, and uh, willingly given uh, by uh, by you as as this is the this is the case. So with 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 that, um, I would uh, you know try to tell also the the team uh, involved in um, in. Uh, on, on our side of uh, of this project, which you know, of course, Jan, uh, Vitada, Richard, uh, but also uh, there were you know other people involved uh, in in this, in particular in preparing the um, the this this particular uh, 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 series of of interactions. So uh, thank you very very much for that, uh, Parn and uh, and others. And I hope we will be able to uh, see you soon in um, in other events that we are organizing. Uh, there are many uh, coming up. I hope Jan has informed uh, has informed everyone about those. And um, and uh, let me stop with that. And I think Vitada has uh, her hand up, so I will uh, give my uh, mic to to Vitada to close. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mia. I, I would like to announce on behalf of ECLAC, our key partner in this FELAC project. As you, as you are aware that this workshop is, is building based on the FELAC fund projects, which is on value chain development between Asia and Latin America. And the, one of the ultimate output of this project is the, the global FELAC IOT, which is now ECLAC is is trying to to make it happen by the end of the project. Uh, so the database on new FELAC global IOTs will be available online. I will share with you the links to the extensive version that ECLAC have been produced so far uh, up to 2011. The, the, the data, but uh, later on by the end of this year, uh, hopefully we will have the 2017 version. So it will combine the structures of uh, ECLAC, of ADB and the OECD TWA together in, in a nice and comprehensive manner to support uh, LAC and Asia IoT initiative, global initiative. Yes, that, that's the message from our key partners in, in ECLAC Secretariat. Uh, 
with that, I, I would like to thank every participants here, this very uh, active sessions and uh, you can send your further question, follow up questions to me and Natapon by email addressing the speakers that you want them to respond. Uh, we have ADB, we have ECLAB, we have Ben and we have SCAP to, to help you answering those questions. Uh, I, I thank specifically the resource person from, from ADB uh, who, who are with us throughout this workshop. Thank you very much. So uh, see you next time if, if we are going to have this workshop again. Bye bye. Thank you all very, very much. Bye bye. Stay safe and stay well and wear the masks. Thank you.